Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham and joining me as always is Matt Wiggins. Hello. It's been so long. It has been so long. Today we are looking finally at No Time to Die from 2021. Asterisk. (laughs) Because it was originally scheduled for release, of course, in 2020 and was really... This was when the bow broke. It was the first major movie tentpole blockbuster to blink and go, you know what? We're not going to release this right now. Mm -hmm. And that would prove to... I don't think that everybody was like, okay, well, now that now that James Bond has done it, now we can, you know, now we can all move on. But it was definitely the first one that I was like, oh, okay, I guess this is happening. Yeah. And then it just delayed and delayed and delayed and it delayed. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be the one that was like the most, the most delayed, right? Like there were other movies that delayed during the pandemic and then pinned themselves to a release date and then eventually came out on that release date. And this one was like, it must, what was delayed to what, three or four separate release dates? over the duration of its postponement. I think so. And they definitely weren't going to do digital only for this. Not for Bond. They were were never going to do that. So originally scheduled for November 2019 and then postponed to February 2020. Oof. If they could have gotten it under the wire, that would have been good. But that was before the director changed. So, hey, the director changed also. We should mention that briefly. (laughs) Originally, Danny Boyle was going to be directing. And only three months before principal photography left the project due to creative differences. That's all we know. And so then they postponed it. They bumped it back a bit to February 2020 and then April 2020. And then there was, oh, yes, the premiere in China and countrywide publicity tour planned for April 2020 were canceled. Mm -hmm. And then it was pushed back to November 2020. And then in October, they delayed it again to April 2021. And then finally, the 8th of October 2021. And it sort of it it released, I don't know exactly, it sort of released sporadically throughout (laughs) September to October. Yeah, it had a really dispersed release depending on market. There was sort of a wide range of dates in there. We had a bunch of people asking us variously on Twitter or in chat rooms or I mean like in like twitch chat or on our discord sort of like hey have you seen it yet because they had seen it and i was going i don't think it's out yet (laughs) and it wasn't here (laughs) anyway at least i couldn't see it but yeah and to that point uh yeah this obviously has taken us a little while to get to but i mean you've been waiting for the movie for long enough (laughs) Not only mm-hmm. were there several delays just like in our own lives, things like Desert Bus and the ongoing <laughs> crushing demoralization of the pandemic in which we are existing, but also I'm glad that we didn't try to bust one out right away because we've now waited long enough that it is out available for rental or purchase on digital platforms, which I did. I just bought it on iTunes for $25. Yeah, so did I. And that means that I could indeed re-watch it. <laughs> So it's not just, this is not watch with love. This is rewatch. So I was able to watch it a second time. Matt's seen it three times. I have. I saw it twice in theaters and then I uh, gave it a while and then I rewatched it last night. And Mm -hmm. it's nice to have some space, like have, you know, it's been two months since I saw it in theaters now. And and so coming back to it and being like, all right, let's revisit my thoughts on this film for Mm -hmm. uh, a third time to sort of like see where it ultimately lands for me. Yeah. So if Danny Boyle didn't direct it, who did? Great question. This was directed by Kerry Joji Fukunaga, who is probably best known for the first series or the first season of the series True Detective. Also limited Netflix series Maniac. Oh, I don't know that one. That was the sort of like psychological sci-fi dramedy with Emma Stone and Jonah Hill. Huh. Okay, maybe I have heard of this. I remember seeing a lot of commercials for it and going, that looks wild. I should watch that. And then I never did. Anyway. Huh. So, yes, Kerry Joji Fukunaga was brought in to handle directing screenplay by standbys Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, mm-hmm. who th- who obviously had an idea in mind. Again, this was only three months out from principal photography and then the story was reworked with fukunaga and indeed fukunaga also has a writing credit on it as does phoebe waller bridge who has written such things as fleabag and killing eve now have you seen killing eve matt i have not it's i've heard of it great it's very good it's a it's about spies Mm, seems like it's in my wheelhouse yeah sandra oh is the lead it's very good it's just yeah it's it's a great series and Daniel Craig basically saw 
her work and was like, oh, we 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 should get her in to, to, to do a pass <laughs> on this. And, you know, because he he has a bit of pull at this point in the proceedings. Right. He asked for Phoebe Waller-Bridge to uh, join the writing team and do do a final draft on it. Did you know that union rules limit how many people can be credited for writing a movie? I did not. I That doesn't surprise me at all, but I didn't know that. Yeah, I, it was actually news to me as well. But again, I'm in sort of the department of no surprise category. That sounds like something that they would do. There's a couple people that did uncredited rewrite work on this movie, including Paul Haggis, who did work on the screenplay for Casino Royale right. and Quantum of Solace, like he's another sort of hand at this. And also Scott Burns, who was the screenwriter for The Bourne Ultimatum. Okay. All right. So several, several people contributing to it. Yeah. That's what? Six altogether? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, <laughs> on the screenplay? There might be more. <laughs> I don't know, right? That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> like that was something Carrie Fisher did a lot of over mm. the years was... So the script doctoring. Yeah, yeah, sort of uncredited script work on stuff. Punch up is important. So, starring Daniel Craig, Rami Malek, Leia Sedu returning, Lashana Lynch, Ben Wyshaw, Naomi Harris, Jeffrey Wright, Christoph Waltz, and Ray Fiennes all returning. Lots of information sort of here and there as we as we move through it. Mm-hmm. Cinematography by Linus Sandgren, who previously worked on Promised Land, American Hustle, La La Land weirdly and first man among first man among yeah. recent works and produced on a budget of somewhere between 250 or 300 million dollars which adjusting for inflation is approximately 250 or 300 million dollars <laughs> you have no idea right. how many episodes i've been waiting <laughs> to, to make that stupid joke uh, about 25 yeah. 27. So far at the box office, 771 million, which is like not astonishing for a Bond film, but it is the third highest grossing film of 2021. And it was like the the first obvious gangbuster this year, right? Because there had been, when this came out, Black Widow had come out and not performed amazingly. And mm-hmm. Shang-Chi had come out and like performed okay. But again, like, I don't know, maybe I'm getting that backwards. Shang-Chi is now, I think, the top grossing film of the year. I'd have to double check that. So I'm looking at worldwide numbers where Shang-Chi is actually eighth. Oh, okay. Because you have to factor in China because the number one and right. two highest grossing movies are Chinese only releases. There's The Battle at Lake Changin and Hi Mom. Right. And then and then No Time to Die. So <laughs> Yeah. And then F nine. Yeah. And then F nine, Detective Chinatown three. That's another Chinese movie. Then Venom, surprisingly, Let There Be Carnage at a worldwide gross of 493 million. Then Godzilla vs. Kong and then Shang-Chi at 431 and then Eternals and Dune. And then Dune, yeah. I still remain satisfied with my statement. It was the first one to really start putting up numbers and yeah. suggest that the, the box office wasn't quite as on life support as it had looked to be at that t- up to that point. Yeah, no, I think they definitely waited long enough, thankfully. It did have the advantage of having two straight Eight years of marketing behind it. Yeah, that's true. In fact, Billie Eilish and Phineas won a Grammy for best song written for visual media on in March 2021, which was six months before the movie came out. <laughs> in other music news, speaking of creative differences, Fukunaga's sort of previous composing partner, Dan Romer, ended up leaving the project in post. Really? Yeah in November 2019, and they brought in Hans Zimmer in 2020. And I gotta say, this doesn't sound like a Hans Zimmer movie. It does not. And I mean that in a good way. I I like Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer does what Hans Zimmer does, and he's very good at doing what Hans Zimmer does, and I like when he goes and does the Hans Zimmer thing, but you can always tell. Yeah. This is very good, but it's not like, oh, here's Hans Zimmer again. Yeah. So (laughs) I I don't want to dive too deep into like opinions on the movie yet, but just because we're in this wheelhouse, so -hmm. much of this movie draws on music from past Bond movies, Mm -hmm. even in the score, the way the music in this movie comes together is almost like a medley of the orchestral version of this movie's title theme, plus drawing reference either direct or implied to several previous Bond movies, one in one in particular they're drawing heavily on. <laughs> and it's like really interesting that they've the way it comes together, like it feels very Bond, but it doesn't feel very you're right, it doesn't feel like a Hans Zimmer score at 
all. Yeah. How much do you want, because we did not, listener at home, discuss this ahead of time. How much do you want to talk about it up front or like where do you want to put our sort of overall <laughs> thoughts? So I'm not going to lie. My The overall tenor of my opinions on this movie are going to become apparent very quickly because this movie <laughs> loses me from the first scene. Amazing. So <laughs> I guess we're just going to talk about it. All right. To anyone who wasn't watching Desert Bus at the time, we were asked to give some sort of preliminary thoughts in Desert Bus. And my my yeah. stated opinion of this movie was to the, the people asking the question to imagine that as of answering this question, I issued forth one long beleaguered sigh that began during Desert Bus and concluded with us recording this episode. Well, that's what that noise was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing it in the background for the past couple of weeks. <laughs> and and watching it a third time didn't really change that opinion. That's not to say that I, I'm not, I'm going to try very hard not to be just intensely negative towards this movie because I think there's a lot in it to like, but it really did a very, very poor job of bringing me on that journey because every time it did something like every time it made a choice it made a choice that offended me <laughs> <laughs> huh? wow so my opinions in this movie are going to be colored by a few things they're going to be affected by the extent to which this is a sequel and trying to conclude the narrative arc of daniel craig's mm -hmm. tenure as Bond, and I don't know that that was a very good idea, and I don't think that there is a really good narrative arc there to conclude, so that's a problem. It also just does a bunch of little aesthetic and stylistic things that just drive me up the wall, and so I'm going to, like, part of my response to this movie is going to be kind of nitpicky in places, because there's just stuff that rubs me the wrong way and so like i'm go i'm gonna get into it i'm gonna get into the things that rub me the wrong way and why they rub me the wrong way and fewer your mileage may vary that like the things that bugged me about this movie may may or may not bug you in the same way whereas i agree with you i think i mean i don't actually know what these nitpicks are gonna be so I, I look forward to find that out because, again, <laughs> listener, Matt and I, apart from this one exchange, we have not actually discussed our opinions of this movie. But it sounds like I'm a lot higher on it than you, which is interesting because we, we're, so. we're generally, generally, we're pretty in line. But I will say that the answer that I gave at that point, Matt, Matt's answer being the long exhaust exasperated sigh or i know i i like i like exasperated actually that's a that's a <laughs> that's a good portmanteau wow yeah patent that yeah that my feeling on the movie aspects of it mirror yours my elevator pitch for my opinion of this movie was that i actually think it is a very good conclusion to the daniel craig arc like, I actually think that with everything that they decided to do and everything that they set up, I think that this is actually a very solid final act to this arc of five movies that I vehemently do not think should have ever been a, <laughs> an, yeah. an arc to begin with. So I agree with you in that, like, the nature of this thing existing, I think, is a mistake. And I definitely agree about, like, what character development are we showing here from Bond and why this doesn't actually need to exist. Right. But if it must, I think they stuck the landing is okay. sort of where I'm coming from. All right. I, I can see that. And for the record, my, my general response to this movie is not like it's not the worst Bond movie. Not by a long shot. It's mm -mm. not the worst Bond movie. There's, as no. I say, there's a lot of stuff in this movie to like. I think the the ending was a little wobblier than stuck, but I mm. like I, I agree with your thesis, though, right? Mm. Like the motions they're making towards like trying to provide a conclusion to an arc that they suppose exists is like pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And like I like I like a lot of the ideas that they had with this movie. I just wish they hadn't been as hamstrung by the decisions they'd made in the previous four. Mm -hmm. because they, there's a better mo version of this movie that exists or that like exists in my mind. There's an alternate universe where they actually made four good movies. And this movie is like the best Bond movie anyone has ever made. Mm -hmm. But what we have is not that. <laughs> that's that's like the 1610 universe compared to the one that we inhabit. Right. Yeah. It's definitely not the worst. They do make a reference to the worst, which I thought was kind of funny. I and mean, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but I will say I went to Seton Theaters. Kathleen went with me and we watched it. 
and ultimately we enjoyed it and we came out of it going like all right that was a fun time you know we didn't come out of it being like oh my god you know like we did after well i mean obviously die another day but you know after like specter where it was like oh you know i i didn't come out of this one going oh you know i was like you know what that was fun at least yeah but i too have nitpicks <laughs> <laughs> So let's let's let us let's, begin. Let's go. Yeah, let's. We do begin it. with a Metro Goldwyn Meyer logo that's been revamped with an English translation of the Ars Gratia Artis motto surmounting the lion, which is "Art for Art's sake," which is a lie because you're doing this for money. But that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing we see is the white dot moving across the screen and Daniel Craig gets a gun barrel sequence. And they've lost me. <laughs> <laughs> is it because he shoots the gun and there's no blood? Because that was weird. No, it's that is weird. Although I, I actually really love the transition here. The The transition is fine. The The thing that gets me, I, I'm already going to launch into my major issues with the movie. Is sure. So much of this movie is about breaking all the toys in the toy box. And yeah. they, they do it for very little reason because it it's, it's done on credit they haven't earned. Mm. And so a lot of the toy breaking just feels like it almost feels malicious, right? Like it's it's like, well, we just have to break it all so that we can start over fresh. And in a movie that is so dead set on violating convention, <laughs> to make that the one that you finally give Daniel Craig a gun barrel on <laughs> is like, come on. <laughs> we've spent four movies like maybe now we can have a real james bond movie and they start us by like hey look it's a real james bond movie and then they proceed to just break every convention from here on out it this didn't bother me on the first watch but it bothers me on subsequent rewatches and i like i understand why they did it they could not deny him a gun barrel forever they have to give every bond a gun barrel so that mm -hmm. they can one day do the all oh, the gun barrel sequences montage, from james yeah. bond, the montage but uh but it just felt like they've they've made such a point of not doing it to this point that it felt almost like a concession to pressure. <laughs> mm. I do like the transition that they do where whoever he's shooting, their vision fades to white and then it transitions to this top down shot of a forest in snow, which you see reflected in the gun barrel, which puts me in yeah. the mind of like the early Brosnan ones with the first time we see the CG gun barrel and then it sort of fades away. And I really like that transition, but you're right. It's not even the full gun barrel sequence. Yeah. The other thing that gets me about this gun barrel sequence is given that every previous Bond movie with Daniel Craig, like every previous Daniel Craig Bond movie hasn't had a conventional gun barrel sequence. There's a shot from the trailer that happens late in the movie, like very late in the movie where Bond has like the AR and he's in a circular concrete hallway and he whips around the corner and points the gun down the hall, which they showed in the trailer over and over and over again. And it's framed exactly like the gun barrel sequence. And mm -hmm. so I came into this movie being like, oh, that's going to be their gun barrel, se like their reference to the gun barrel. That'll be the end of the pre-title. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh, OK, I get it. I get it. They've done it again. They're, they're going to give us that as our, our gun barrel sequence. I'm just quickly trying trying to find the time code of the shot but it violated my expectation because i was like oh okay we're getting a we're getting a regular gun barrel here fine i guess <laughs> so and anyhow i was just like i was so prepared for that to be the the opening like in skyfall where they did basically the same thing i was so prepared for that mm -hmm. that i was i was like oh well this feels almost boring by comparison now <laughs> but i do like the transition and through the transition we see a man walking through the woods with a gun and a big sort of parka and he's walking towards this house on a lake of ice and inside the house there is a woman who is reclining on the couch and smoking and a little girl playing with a tamagotchi which i guess is supposed to date this movie but i don't actually know when this is meant to be because like tamagotchis are back like now but originally this would have been <laughs> i think this i think this actually works fine in the timeline it's totally cool anyway this little girl's name is madeline and if you've been remembering correctly this will be a young madeline swan which was leia sido's character from specter now i actually didn't remember that that was her first name but oh. this look this little girl looks so much like her that i was like oh this is young swan isn't it i forgot that her name was madeline but the the, <laughs> the casting is brilliant the casting in this movie is great big ups to the casting director on this movie yeah with 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 one 
small asterisk that is a me problem, <laughs> which okay. I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. Okay. Beautiful shot of the girl going downstairs as it tracks out and you see the man walking towards the cabin in the distance. I just, I really, really like that shot. So the mom is thirsty and needs this girl to get her box wine. This mom is, she is colossally day drunk. Yes. I was like, do you need your medicine, mother? Yeah. <laughs> yes, darling. <laughs> and they have a little talk about her dad. She's I don't know why she's deciding to do this now, but she's like, what did you think your dad does? They're, they're talking in French, by the way, but she's smashed. She's like, what did you think your dad does? And she's like, my dad helps. He's a doctor. He heals people. And she's like, Haha, he kills people. And it's like, well, geez, mom. <laughs> All right. And then mom passes out and drops the red wine on the floor. And so the, the daughter's like, oh, mom's in the sauce again and goes and gets stuff to clean it up. And we see that under the sink and presumably in other places around the house, but at least under the sink is a handgun stuck to the wall under the sink for emergencies, I guess. And the girl is aware of that. She also becomes very quickly aware of that man standing directly outside the window. And it's a jarring image because he's wearing a no theater mask. So it's this like, I guess not expressionless because it's got a bit of a, say, a mischievous grin almost. Mm -hmm. It's an unsettling image. So good job there. So she's trying to wake her mom up and mom's passed out. And then she, she tries to run and get into what is clearly a panic room. And we see a little shot of inside the panic room where there's a specter ring in there. Cause of course this is Mr. White from Casino Royale. This is, if you recall that whole, this is the, this is the problem with continuity and bond movies is that mm. you, need to, you need to actually have been watching them all. So the guy comes in, approaches the mother who's like, I'm looking for, you know, is the man of the house home? And she's like, no, he's not here. And he says, he killed my whole family. So guess what? And kills her mother. She's hiding upstairs. He goes around looking for her because he doesn't actually know, I think, that there's necessarily anybody else there. But then he hears the Tamagotchi. <laughs> <laughs> The, the 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 curse of the Tamagotchi. Anyway, he hears that and turns around and is ready to light up the bed that she's hiding under. But instead, she pops up and shoots the crap out of him with a gun. And we knew about this. She told this story. That's why I remembered because she she talked about how like men came to my house to try and kill me or whatever when I was a little girl. She I think it was Inspector. Well, it would have had to have been. I recall yeah. her telling this story to Bond. I think when they were at Lamerican. Which I had I had forgotten that she had told that story, but that that just makes one of my complaints about this movie even stronger. But we'll get there in a moment. No worries. <laughs> She is successful, seemingly, and she blows off part of the no mask in the process and then cut to her dragging the body outside and leaving a trail of blood behind. And then he wakes up or regains consciousness and sits up. So, I, you know, I guess she missed the vitals, even though it seems that she hit him at least partly in the face. We only see a little bit of his face, but it looks like he's got some sort of skin issue. And then she freaks out and takes off running out across this frozen lake. He, for some reason, still has his gun. And that's only on the rewatch was I like, why does he still have his gun? Why? Why wouldn't she have taken that away? <laughs> There's a lot that doesn't make sense about this sequence. She shoots Safin. We, d we don't know it's Safin. The man. She shoots the man like multiple. She unloads the entire clip of the gun into him. Technically, it's a magazine, but continue. Sure. Unloads the entire magazine until the gun is like clicking yeah. <laughs> at this guy. Shoots him multiple times. He falls off a loft onto the floor down below and is clearly like not breathing. Right. Mm -hmm. Like he's he's dead. <laughs> Man is dead. Then she has time to, like, go put on snow boots and a jacket and drag this, like, full-grown man as a, like, a young girl down out of the house <laughs> through the snow before he starts breathing again. So there's, like, clearly, like, ten minutes have elapsed here before he comes, like, comes back to life. It's like with Bond villains that have a gimmick, it really feels like they're going for a thing here where it's like he's the unkillable man. It really feels like he's dead and he comes back to life. If you're looking at the timeline, it's not like he's just been unconscious for a minute or two. It's been a while. 
And if you look at the bullet wounds, there's one basically on his heart. Yeah. And there's no payoff for that. Like this. Yeah, they never do anything with it. This guy, we will discover, is not like he doesn't have something in his brain that makes him not feel pain. He uh, <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't have a robotic chest. He's not an android. He hasn't spent years of I don't know whatever the hell tantric learning to to not process <laughs> to I don't know to be able to stop his own blood from escaping his body or something. He, no, he's just he's a guy. Right. And this this is notably the second time he has survived something fatal. Yes. Because we will learn that he has also previously survived a poisoning. Which we assume is why his face looks like that. Like it we, we yeah. it doesn't look like this later, but in this instance it's happened recently, so I assume that the highly visible veins in his face is as a result of the surviving the poisoning, we think. But yeah. I, I don't know. But then it just never comes up again. No. <laughs> It's not like something he gets to use to his advantage at any later point in the film. No, that's true. The girl, young Madeline Swan, runs away across the frozen lake, which starts cracking under her feet. And then she falls through the ice into the frigid water and starts drifting towards Safin, who takes aim and looks at her for a moment. And she looks directly up at him through the ice. Then he shoots in a circle around her to break the ice up and reaches in and grabs her out of the lake and pulls her up to the surface. And then we, in a very good transition, I'll admit, cut to Madeline Swan now as an adult surfacing out of the water in the ocean as she's going for a swim. And we're in the present day. And we're now, well, I mean, not quite, actually. I mean, I guess we're in the present day, but technically we're, there's another time jump. Oh, you're right. There is another yeah. time jump. This is, this is after the events of Spectre is what's happening here. And Bond is there. He comes down to the beach because she looks a little discombobulated and he's like, are you okay? She's like, yeah, let's, let's, you know, let's, let's get going. Then we dissolve to a beautiful shot of them both in the Aston Martin, the old school Aston Martin, the silver one, driving along this coastal road, winding along with the contours of the mountainside. And she says, you know, maybe what if you drive a little faster? And he says, why, why do, why do you want to go faster? We have all the time in the world. And I say out loud in the theater, come on! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm immediately on death watch, right? I'm like, oh, yeah, poor Madeline Swan, right? To their credit, that doesn't end up being what happens. But, you know, I think for the people who work on Bond and the people who are super fans of the series, I think OHMSS casts a long shadow. Me too. <laughs> I, like, I think it lives rent free in the heads of people who work in movies. Yeah. Even though, as we said in the episode, the general public maybe wasn't as up on it at the time. It's clear that the people who make movies love that movie. Mm -hmm. Which is a little unfortunate in this case. I found the fact that they come back to this particular reference, like this specific reference, the all the time in the world reference, and mm -hmm. the song cue twice in the film actually really bugged me. Really? Oh, yeah. It felt like a really cheap reference to make in context, like a, just a really like, oh, OK, <laughs> I see what you're doing. Like, you're right. It immediately put me on death watch, but it's also just, I really didn't like it. I'm like, oh, come on. You haven't earned this. You've truly not earned this. And so I, it just put me, it put my guard up right away. Mm. And so, I mean, we haven't even gotten to the point where I think the movie should have started yet. So <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all in, it would like, we're completely in the part of the film that I think you could just fast forward through before starting the movie. So we'll we'll get there. I'll call out the specific shot that I think should actually be the first shot of the film. But right now we are firmly in the territory of like parts of the movie that just feel like wasted air for me. That's fair. I think that's, I think that's reasonable. I think it's like neat potentially to have that background on Swan and her relationship to Safin, but like it's only very minorly relevant as it turns out, well, for him to have it, that They use connection. it to confuse the movie. They do a bit. Yeah, that's fair. But it's done in a way that doesn't make sense. Mm. And we'll talk about that more as they start to draw on it in the story. But it, it is a, just a straight up a part of this movie that makes no sense. And it's mm -hmm. like they're using it for conflict in the script, but it's not something that should be generating conflict at all. But we'll get there. We'll get there. The scene, by the way, on the road here is in Italy, whereas the one in OHMSS was in Portugal, and they are not the same filming location. Like, they were they were on camera in Italy and Portugal, respectively, and they are also mm -hmm. 
that is also the the filming location. So it just looks very similar. And it's a gorgeous shot. Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> I also love the shot coming through the tunnel to reveal the location of the city, which looks fake, but isn't. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's beautiful location. Yeah, it looks like Middle Earth. <laughs> it does almost. I mean, it doesn't help that there's a bunch of fires all around the town. Now, as they're walking to their hotel room, because they're just, you know, they're just bumming around on vacation in, in, in Italy, the man carrying their bags explains why everything's on fire. I don't know if this is a real tradition, but apparently everyone is uh, writing stuff down they're like uh, wishes or confessions or whatever. They're writing stuff down on pieces of paper and lighting them on fire to sort of like release it into the... It's like a cleansing thing. Yeah, letting go of the past. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Let the past die. Kill it if you have to. <laughs> Abrupt cut to Bond and Swan porking in the hotel room. Mm -hmm. And then cut to them chatting afterwards where turns out they still don't know a lot about one another or at least they don't know everything about one another they sort of make a deal that it's like all right look swan says look you need to make peace with vesper because that's still been weighing on you and then i'll tell you my stuff and she's like i mean you could do it now she's buried in the acropolis in this town and bond is like i know i know that i know exactly where she's buried it's weird that you were there but okay it's it's strange how they keep going back to to vesper it's all in the, like, they're really working to try and drive the idea that there's some sort of narrative arc to Bond, where there isn't. <laughs> there's the two movies where Bond is all about Vesper, then there's Skyfall that happens, and then there's Spectre, where they try to retcon everything in the previous three movies into having been a, a grand master plan of Bond's half-brother, Dr. Evil. <laughs> And then there, there's this one where it's like, okay, now this one is the sequel to that one. And so in order for the story to progress, it's like, okay, well, now Bond's new love of his life, he has to, like, let go of his attachment to Vesper in order for this relationship to progress. Again, I think it's mostly unearned. <laughs> <laughs> the groundwork, the like the elements that they're drawing on were all there in those movies, but it just feels like they're really trying to force this. And again, we're still not at the shot that I think should open the film. So we're still all in like wasted pathos, right? We're trying to do like relationship building between them, but it won't matter. And we're trying to do like character history building, but it's all referring to stuff we've already seen. We're not getting any information that actually aids the story of the film. And we're 10 minutes into the movie. <laughs> And it's not like they laid the groundwork for that, right? They didn't, they basically do every movie as a brand new, like they never know if they're going to be able to get the same actors back in subsequent movies. Right. And so they didn't, certainly not with Casino Royale, they didn't go in and go like, all right, here's our five act structure. Thank, thank God that they didn't, yeah. frankly. And so, yeah, it really was with Spectre. They were like, well, here's what we have currently. So let's ram jam all this together. And then looking at this movie, it's like, all right, we ram jammed everything together. How do we get out of it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's even just a tighter version of this movie that does that in an okay way, mm -hmm. but it, it needs to be about a half an hour shorter and a whole bunch of scenes need to come out. So I actually thought that for a movie of this length, which is preposterous because it's 163 minutes, <laughs> I actually felt like it was a well-paced 163 minutes. Yes. That said, I agree with you that there's a bunch of stuff that you could cut out. Yes. So it's not a question of pacing for me. It's just there's a bunch of unnecessary stuff in the movie that yeah. doesn't aid the story at all. Yeah, because I didn't feel like it dragged. And I've watched shorter movies that have felt longer. And this didn't. So props to that. But I yeah. agree with you that this there's a bunch of stuff that could be not here. Yeah. In the morning, Bond is walking across this cool bridge. Everything is stone here, which is why nothing gets <laughs> lit on fire when everyone's hurling fiery paper out of their windows. I'm actually going to pull you back just a little bit because there's, oh, yeah. a, there's a scene, we've just sort of glossed over it here, but there's a shot of Madeline and Bond after they've hooked up, having a conversation about Bond being like, yeah, I'm, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll go to the Acropolis and I'll, I'll let Vesper go so that we can carry on. And then you'll tell me where we're going next. While he's doing that, Madeline goes over to the desk and writes Lom Mask on a 
piece of paper, Mm -hmm. tears it, lights it on fire, and throws it out the window. Again, like letting go of the past, right? The mask man. And the whole purpose of this is to make this the big... They're talking about how Madeline has a secret that, like, a part of her past that she hasn't told Bond about. And they keep, with the whole opening sequence, and now with this, they continue to drive that this mask man is this terrible secret that she's carrying with her. I just want to, like, note that that happens. <laughs> All right. Remember that for later. The whole, like, trying to confuse the story of this movie to make it seem like more than it is. There's going to be lots of references over the course of the movie to the the secret that Madeline has that Bond doesn't know. This is not the secret. Huh. <laughs> It does not make sense for this to be the secret. This is just, it isn't, this is not it. This is in this instance. But as you say, in the previous movie, she told Bond that like a man came to her house and killed her family. (laughs) So like, this is not some mysterious aspect of her, like maybe he doesn't have a ton of detail, but like, this is not it. This is not actually the thing that is going to become the important thing that she is keeping from Bond. And it not being this, with this being in the opening, makes the whole timeline of the movie completely nonsense. They just want the audience to think that this masked man is her secret and that the big central conflict of the movie is that this masked man in her past is going to haunt Bond. And it's just it's like that's not actually the thing that the movie cares about. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and by trying to make it confusing and like like by trying to obscure it, it actually undercuts the thing that they actually could have built some suspense around. We know about this already. It's the first thing they show us in the movie. So it's not like we don't know what's going on in Madeline's past. And so there's no mystery there other than just the mystery of sitting in your seat and being like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't she have just told him that? Mm -hmm. So anyhow, yes. Then we move on to the morning and Bond is like, all right, I'm going to go do this. And then you're going to tell me where we're going next. And she says home. And I think that is the first scene of this movie. Right. So that is where I think this movie should have started. Bond wakes up, gets dressed, says to Madeline, "Okay, I'm going to go do this thing. We can just remember that Madeline was the love interest of the previous movie and the movie can just trust us to do that yeah and he just says i'm going to go do this thing and then you're going to tell me where we're going next and she says home and then we cut to him walking up the mountainside if the movie opens there we lose no narrative information at all Hmm. and we cut right into an action scene because again the whole point of safin being unkillable is a red herring or well red herring or or just is not actually a thing at all maybe it doesn't maybe it's not even a real thing and the opening with madeline doesn't give us any information it doesn't tell us anything all right so 12 minutes into the movie the movie starts and bond goes and asks the like cemetery keeper i guess like hey i'm looking for the lind vault or whatever and then this guy takes him over there and yeah it's like this grassy hillside covered in you know little mausoleums and there's one for vesper lind he goes up to it and they i do appreciate that there's a one little refrain in the music of the theme song from Casino Royale. Mm -hmm. And he has a piece of paper where he's written, forgive me. And he lights that on fire and throws it to the ground. Someone I saw noted that the motto surmounting the tomb here, it's in Latin and it roughly translates to what I am, you too will become. Oh, wow. (laughs) Foreshadowing. If you know Latin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) So it's like, oh, that's, whoa, spicy, okay. As he drops the piece of paper with the note on it, he sees that there's another piece of paper with a bundle of roses with a Spectre logo on it, and he realizes a half second too late that something is up as the tomb explodes. Just, just boom. (laughs) Like in a a pretty unsurvivable way, but no, no, it's not Safin, it's Bond that's the unkillable one. <laughs> I mean, it takes him a moment. He gets completely knocked unconscious and is totally out of breath. And you got the tinnitus, like, ear-ringing, high-pitched noise. And he's fumbling around like a fool. But, you know, he does, he does in fact, survive. He tries to get his phone out. His weird phone. It's, like, not a modern phone. Apparently, <laughs> because of the delays of this movie, they had to do some reshoots of product integrations. Because... No. <laughs> 
<laughs> they were now like a year and a half out of date. Right. Of like the cell That's phone hilarious. technology. Like they did a, I think it was Nokia did a TV commercial with Lashana Lynch, who shows up later. In the movie, she's still using the old, the older model, but they had to like CG the newer model into her hands in, in a commercial that they had made. I love I it. I believe. Yeah, I don't know exactly all of the details, but anyway, so <laughs> surviving a... An explosion that would kill any other human being. Bond runs back, sees that the cemetery keeper has taken off, is chasing the guy who showed him to the tomb across the bridge when the the, the, the goons descend. And boy, do they. They pin him in on the bridge. There's a car on one side and a guy on a motorbike on the other side. And so Bond's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to jump. And so he just <laughs> runs at the side of the bridge, grabs a, like a wire Oh, I'm sorry. He also gets shot. He does get shot. And it's like he's he's stunned silent. And he doesn't know what's going on. And then he gets shot. And he's like, huh, I've been shot. <laughs> he gets shot like in the shoulder. And that like alerts him to the fact that there's someone behind him. He's like, ow, what the? Oh, there's a car driving at me. All right. Anyway, he runs to the side of the bridge, grabs a big cable and like swings out under the bridge and lands underneath it. It's a very cool looking stunt. Problem with the movie having just come out is I don't know as much like behind the scenes information, but uh, you know. I, I know one little bit of behind the scenes information about this sequence. Yeah. Without like going through it by shot by shot. This is just an awesome action sequence. This action sequence is great. Yeah, I think it it's really, really good. It is. It's this chase all through this like rustic Italian city built on a mountainside as uh, Bond is being like chased by motorcycle dudes and guys in cars and the whole bit. And he, he manages to fight with the henchman. Mm. We'll have this one recurring henchman here who's got a robotic eye and Bond gets into a fight with him. And the piece of information that's revealed in this fight is that Blofeld sends his regards and that Madeline is a daughter of Spectre. Mm -hmm. And he puts this idea in Bond's mind that Madeline has betrayed him and she's given them his location. And that's that's why they know he's there. Because she had said, you need to go to where Vesper's buried. Yes. And, and yeah. she, was the, she was the impetus for him going there. So it's very easy for him to believe that because, of course, he doesn't trust anybody. But he does choke the guy out, the guy nicknamed Cyclops. He does choke him out, not enough to kill him, but enough to pop the eye out of his head. <laughs> <laughs> Which he takes. We, we don't see him take it, but we, we learn that he's taken the eye. Wait, do we? Yeah, because he has the eye later on. I thought that was a different eye. I thought that was the eye from Cuba. A different eye. He doesn't like Cyclops doesn't have the eye for the remainder of this fight. I, I assume that he just took the eye. Fair enough. I guess you could be right. It could be it could be either. Anyhow, the, the bit of information he takes Cyclops's bike. Yes. And, like his motorbike and drives off on it. And we have this motorbike set of stunts that happen as Bond is trying to make his escape. There's a scene where he rides this motorbike up a staircase and over a wall into a crowd of people, which was heavily featured in the trailers. An incredible stunt. My understanding in terms of the like behind the scenes information here is that in order for this stunt to work, they had to pour just gallons and gallons and gallons of Coca-Cola onto the cobbles. <laughs> I heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> to give the bike enough grip. Yeah, that it could land. Yeah. Because there wasn't enough traction on the, the landing pad. So in order to make the road sticky, they had to coat the entire place in Coca-Cola <laughs> and let it dry. Mm -hmm. Apparently 77,000 US dollars because it was 8,400 8, gallons of Coca-Cola. <laughs> And apparently, you know, because they, they cleaned it all up afterwards, apparently everything looked really clean afterwards. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. It's, just, it's like, apparently that's just the stunt coordinator was like, this is just what we do. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Said, we just use Coca-Cola because it works really well for this. <laughs> Can there not be a different solution? No, no. Don't fix what ain't broken, right? Yeah. And Coke was one of the like production partners too. <laughs> They'd have to be if he used that much. Yeah. Hey, uh... Got a call from Aeon Productions. Uh huh. Yeah, they want they want um thirty one thousand liters of Coca Cola. What? How thirsty? Are... No, 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 no. They're gonna pour it all over a rustic Italian town. <laughs> Why? So the motorcycle doesn't slide. Hold the. Are you? <laughs> yeah. Are you awake right now? Or are you just like dream talking? What the hell? It is a very good. It, it's a shame that there's there's a lot in this movie that upon like greater scrutiny, I realize is real and that I initially am just like, oh, that was a cool CG. Oh, yeah. 
Like that 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 jump is like looks like it could just be fake, but it's real and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he gets back to the hotel and the porter is like, uh, "But sir, your your bags are just down here, like your wife requested." Also driving further suspicion in, into Bond, so he heads upstairs. Great shot of Swan going to check her makeup in a mirror and. In the mirror, we see reflected Bond standing in the doorway. I love the line from Bond there, letting go is hard. <laughs> right, because he <laughs> looks like absolute crap. Because he's just been exploded and chased on a motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. Bond in his explosion addled tremendous, and I think not unjustified, distrust of Madeline, considering what just happened and what the guy from Spectre said and the whole like, oh, no, your bag's already down here. Like it, it all, if he stopped to think about it for like a couple seconds, then, you know, maybe he might not be so, so suspicious. But in this moment, you know, he's been, he's quite rattled. He does get a moment yeah. to think in a few minutes. <laughs> and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say in a calm situation, but he does get a moment to think. Anyway, the car chase continues now in the Aston Martin. Also a very cool action sequence. This whole car chase is very cool. I like yeah. There's a flock of sheep. There's someone tending the flock of sheep and the guy gets a phone call and it's subtitled. It's like, release the sheep. What? Why? Because if you don't, I'll kill you. Oh, all right. <laughs> and so Bond actually gets to use, he get to use some some gadgets. The car. Yeah. The car has gadgets and we get to actually use them. He's got like caltrops and stuff and that's fun. I like the caltrops. Oh, right. While they're driving around, Swan gets a phone call and she pulls her phone out of her purse. And of course, the caller ID picture is the Spectre logo. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> why do you have them in your contact? But of course, this is this is more this is more Blofeld doing stuff. Anyway, she answers the phone at Bond's behest. It's Blofeld who's like, "Oh, thanks, Madeline. You're doing a great job. You know, your sacrifice will be. We we really appreciate this. Thank you for. You know, your daddy would be so proud. Like really <laughs> hammering home the whole like, get it, Bond. She's working for us. Yeah." Which, to be fair, like at this point, the audience doesn't know, but the audience also assumes that that's not what's happening. Right. I mean, it, part of that is just Leia Sudu really plays this scene, this whole sequence really, really well. Yeah. Like, she's just a very good actress. And that, like, the moment to think that you mentioned where she's like begging James to do something and get them out of this situation. And she just looks up with like tears in her eyes and like snot dripping from her nose because she's so distraught. Just this pouting like I didn't I didn't do it <laughs> like it wasn't me that basically convinces James to like, OK, I'll do something. And like, I did, you know, he, he sort of gets most of the way there to realizing that she is not the one in control of this situation at the very least. Mm -hmm. And probably that she didn't at least knowingly betray him. Yeah. And her her performance in this scene is just really, really, really good and sells mm -hmm. it really, really, really well. Yeah. The Aston Martin gets cornered and surrounded in a square and everyone just unloads their weapons at it. And of course, the Aston Martin is completely, utterly bulletproof to an astonishing degree. And so they're both <laughs> sitting inside. Bond's remaining you know, fairly unflappable. And Swan, of course, is freaking out as these impacts appear on the car all around them. And then Cyclops, whatever his, he, his character has a name, but they only ever call him Cyclops in the movie. Primo, I believe is his actual name. So Primo gets his own gun out and walks over to the car and just starts hammering the same location on the bulletproof glass over and over again. And it's right at Swan. And we see it get progressively less and less. We see the structural integrity of the glass begin to fail as she's as you say begging and then eventually bond is like okay flips a button the little mini guns come out from behind the headlights <laughs> and then he just starts doing a drift doing drift circles and blowing up all of them and then he hits the smoke and then the smoke pops off my favorite part of this my favorite part of this is the spent casings ejecting from the vents on the side of the aston martin it's so good <laughs> oh i hadn't even noticed that good thinking q oh yeah good thinking q oh that's great that's very good Making their escape under cover of smokescreen, Bond and Swan make it back into town and to the train station with their car looking like hell. And Bond walks her over to a train that's about to leave. You get the impression at this point that he's like, all right, I, I don't think that you actually betrayed me, but we can't be together because it's not safe for either of us. She says, well, how, how will I know that you're okay? And he says, you won't. You'll never see me again. 
and she reacts very poorly to that. And I only noticed this on my rewatch. Mm -hmm. She grabs her stomach. Oh, yeah. When he says, you'll never see me again. So spoilers for later in the movie. <laughs> she is already at this point pregnant and knows that she is and hasn't told Bond. And when he says, you'll never see me again, she reflexively grabs her stomach. I thought that was a really nice detail. Yeah, I didn't notice that. I didn't notice it on my first watch either. That fixes my complaint about the timeline not making sense. Oh. If she already knew at this point, then it's... Because she says, one one of the quips in here is, I have something to tell you. And Bond says, I bet you do. And oh, right. They've been talking about how she has a secret to tell him. And the movie has been, to this point, making it look like it's her past. It's not. And if she already knows, the thing I have to tell you is that she's carrying his child, right? If that groundwork which you're right, has already been laid in the opening here. Literally everything to do with her past is just red herring. Like it just it adds right. nothing. <laughs> it's, to be fair, that's very subtle, but I appreciate it is. that it's there. But anyhow, that as the train leaves transitions us into the opening titles. 24 minutes, not only the longest Bond film, the longest pre-title sequence in any mm -hmm. Bond. This By is ten, almost 10 minutes. I was going to say, this is 10 minutes longer than Tomorrow Never Dies. So they just cut the first 12 minutes off, like I suggested, and we get back into yeah. a normal pre-title. <laughs> or was it, was it The World Is Not Enough? The World Is Not Enough at 1420. That's the one, The World Is Not Enough, thank you. All right. And then Die Another Day at 1327 yeah. before oh, that. Right. It's been a while. <laughs> Since we've done these, the very beginning, the very beginning of the opening title sequence graphics are a hard throwback to Dr. No with the multicolored dots. Oh, oh, yes, they are. And I noticed that the first time. And yeah. it's, I like the dots. They should yeah. do the dots more. Because it's a it's a <laughs> it's an anniversary, right? It's it's a bond anniversary. Yeah. So opening title sequence visually designed once again by Daniel Kleinman, who's been on it mm -hmm. for years and opening title song No Time to Die co-written and performed by Billie Eilish, as we mentioned, for which she mm -hmm. won a Grammy along with Phineas, who is her brother and co-writer on this song. Now, when this song was released, because this song, again, it won the Grammy before the movie was even out and it was released before it was originally intended for the movie to be released. So this song has right. been out there for a while. Yeah. You listened to it immediately. I did. I pointedly did not. The first time I oh. heard this was when I saw the opening titles because I wanted to see it in context for the very first time. Right. And if I recall correctly, you didn't love it. Oh, I this song huffs. <laughs> <laughs> did you like it any better in context? No. All right. It's just so sluggish and so dour. It does nothing for me. So seeing it for the first time in context of the opening titles and then again on the rewatch, I started actually quite liking it. I was like, OK, yes, this works. You know, it's a, it's a it's one of the down tempo numbers. It's not like it's not the banger section. Oh, what are our definitely ballad? Thank you. What are our categories? There we go. Right. It's a ballad banger and belter, but right. definitely ballad. It's definitely ballad. And it needed to go belter at the end. Yeah. It starts as a ballad and it's like slow and it's, you know, it feels like it's building and then it just doesn't build. It just sort of continues at that kind of level of energy for the whole thing. And I, yeah. I think it really needed, I think if it had had a, just a turn up in the last third, then I think it actually could have been really, really good as it is for me, the song I was like, yeah, okay, it did, you know what, it's fine. I have... Certainly, I have no ill will towards Billie Eilish. I, I I watch the Vanity Fair interview every year. Have you seen that? I have seen that it exists. As I okay. say, I like I have I've paid so little attention to Billie Eilish over the course of her career that you can just assume I'm not. I have not tuned in. All right. <laughs> I'm I'm writing down Matt Wiggins deeply uncool. That's fair. Yeah. I'm an old. I know I'm an old. <laughs> It's all I, right. To be fair, I don't. I, I I would not say that I listen to Billie Eilish. I have heard a bunch of her songs, and I'm like, yeah, right, cool. Yeah, I think she's quite talented. Yeah, I get it. And honestly, her singing here, I think, is really good. I just think I just it it needed to be a ballad that becomes a belter, and it was just like a ballad at the same level the whole way along, and it yeah. never it needed to land harder, and it doesn't. Yeah, it, it does a similar thing to Writings on the Wall, mm -hmm. in the last movie. It has a rise. There's a melodic rise in the song where it does the dun, 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 and it feels like it's building. And then it just drops back 
to the super listless vocal delivery and it like it i have said before i think these are basically the same song and it's not because they sound exactly alike like the melodies aren't the same but they follow a really similar pattern of letting the orchestration do all of the the work <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and provide any energy to the song and the the vocal delivery is just listless and dull listless vocal delivery is kind of billy eilish's thing yeah i just want more i just mm -hmm. want more yeah no i agree i don't know i <laughs> feel some joy these are supposed to be fun movies right <laughs> like i'm here mm -hmm. for big bombastic action scenes and cool gadgets and fun world traversing adventures and the opening pre-title and the credit scene are supposed to prime me for the things that follow and when you drop a really plodding <laughs> <laughs> opening title track into the movie it's just like okay it just makes the movie feel downbeat and that's not what i'm tuning into a bond movie for i'm not here for a downbeat adventure and it's not like it's giving me a rest because the whole previous 25 minutes you know there was nine minutes of action scene but it was a 25 minute opening and like i'm i'm like literally begging the movie to build to something and we're just about to go into like an entire first act of exposition <laughs> <laughs> so like give me some things to cling to here in terms of the giving the movie some energy and thrust and and i don't, like the opening title does not accomplish that at all so if that's if that's your opinion sort of when watching it initially having now seen the rest of the movie do you feel that that that, that is thematically appropriate <laughs> A little bit. We'll get into it. The movie has some really great upbeat stuff in it, but I, I don't know. I, I get what they're doing, but I just particularly on the back of the previous film, like just opening the movie with a dirge <laughs> yep. is I don't know. I like I get it. I understand. But please don't. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. we can do the things this movie is doing and still have fun along the way and the movie to its credit the movie tries <laughs> yeah visually i think kleinman does a lot of cool stuff here particularly i love the image of there's this spiral of handguns oh that yeah start firing and they're firing at one another such that the line of smoke between two handguns just makes like one solid line and then you realize that the guns are arranged in a double helix so yeah. it's like dna as a weapon that comes into play as a big thing in the movie i i would go so far as to say that is the only really iconic visual from this opening though true i like the detail that it's showing a bunch of sort of obscuring through again through like line work some shots of bond and swan and then on the line in the song faces from my past then it's a shot of vesper and only in that one and there's like a visual mm -hmm. reference to the intro to casino royale there's hands of a clock that look like mm -hmm. sort of the bits from playing cards and it's definitely meant to be like a invoking the sort of the casino royale thing yeah. but i think that's i think that's fair to say the the rest of it is sort of I mean, there's a bit with Safin's mask that's like cool, but that's mostly on the basis of the, the mask is creepy. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I'm i trying to bring to mind the things that are in this opening title. And there's like the statue that frosts over stained with blood. And... I just noticed. Sorry. I just noticed there is a shot of some stuff in silhouette, including a scuba diver with like flippers and a harpoon gun. And it's like that's that that is not a thing in this movie. <laughs> No. Is this no no is this like what movie was it that had like secret frogmen? It was the the one with uh, uh no, it was Diamonds Are Forever, remember? There was the the oil rig, right? Oh, it all yeah. end, it all ends on the oil rig and on the poster there was the frogmen and they shot that part but didn't end up using the naval attack from the sea. Right. <laughs> we found them. <laughs> I do actually want to say absolute banger of a transition out of this because it gets sort of like oh, yeah a, like a kaleidoscope the kaleidoscope effect unfurls into this beautiful shot of a building reflecting a sunrise and it's just the way that it transitions back into the main body of the movie is very strong but i agree with oh, you yeah. in that gun double helix a plus visual from the opening titles otherwise not a barnstormer no i can't believe we're already half an hour into this movie <laughs> It's five years later. 
No, but in the movie, it's five years later. It says that on screen at this point. And a crack team of mercenaries are rappelling down the face of this building. And they they break into the building. They do this cool, they use some sort of cool gadget that cuts a whole pane of glass out that I guess because of the cushion of air underneath it falls silently to the floor on the inside of the building. Makes It, it makes a little bit of a thud, but not it's like, like a, a smash. Yeah, just a thud. I appreciate that this team is repelling upside down and we start to see it's like we we see sort of like a POV from them. So we're looking like upside down into the hallway and then we look at them from the hallway also upside down. And then as they unbuckle and flip around, the camera also rotates. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. And there's a lot of really nice shots in this movie that I that I really appreciate. So where are they? Well, it's some sort of lab and like a lot of scientists hanging around and we see three of them in particular one of them gets up to go get something out of the fridge and the other two make a big deal of like, oh, wait, where did I put that highly infectious smallpox I was working on? Like, oh, what? You mean the really, really bad one? The one that's that's like terribly awful? Yeah, I don't know where I put it. I don't know where it could be. And then the third scientist pulls his soup out of the fridge and it has the label on it from the smallpox, <laughs> implying that I don't know if, if it's implying that they actually tampered with his lunch or if they just put the sticker on it. And he's like, well, either way, this is ruined. You guys, are, thanks. You're really fine. Funny. It's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to give you one of these days. I'm going to give you Ebola and I'll then I'll be laughing. I'll sit here and watch your face melt off. That'll be hilarious. It's like <laughs> this is a this is a weird workplace. <laughs> yeah. Healthy, healthy workplace environment. Absolutely. <laughs> this was the one casting choice that I, that I was like, whoa, what? Hang on, huh? Because the <laughs> one of the I guess we'll say the bully scientists is played by Hugh Dennis. He's a British comedian and a panel show mainstay. Like he's mm -hmm. one of the regular panelists on Mock the Week. And he's also on an entire season of Taskmaster, which is where I first came to know him. And so we're sitting there in the theater and I'm like, who is that? And Kathleen's <laughs> like, he was on Taskmaster. And I'm like, oh, right, because he's really silly. <laughs> And so seeing him as just like, just like random scientist cameo in No Time to Die was a surprise, shall we say. Mm -hmm. He was also in a few episodes of Fleabag. That makes sense. Yeah, which Phoebe Waller-Bridge worked on. And maybe that was the connection. He played a bank manager in four episodes. So I don't know, yeah. maybe that's, maybe that's where that connection was. But I was like, what is Hugh Dennis doing here? This is really strange. <laughs> The other scientist, the one being picked on, is Dr. Valdo Ubrachev, or Obrachev, played by David Denick, who is a Danish-Swedish actor who has been in Tinker Tailor's Soldier Spy, Chernobyl. And apparently he was meant to have a smaller role in the movie, but Fukunaga liked him so much that just sort of kept him around in the plot. It was like, he yeah. Could he could still be useful later on. And I, I actually, I like that. I, I kind of like that, you know, he's like a recurring, he's like in a final fantasy game where you have the mini bosses that aren't a threat, but just keep showing up. Yeah. He's a little <laughs> bit like, I mean, to just throw reference to an old Bond movie, he's a little bit like Boris. He is a bit. Goldeneye. Like he he's is this bit, yeah. movie's Boris. Mm -hmm, definitely. He gets a phone call. Who's like, they're here. And he just thinks it's a prank or whatever. And like, what? Who's here? Spectre. Spectre is here. And he's like, oh, OK. And immediately starts doing stuff with his computer and putting stuff on an SD card. The voice on the phone instructs him to swallow the SD card or USB key or whatever, which he does. And the voice on the phone tells him they are under the impression that they need you. So give them the thing and they won't hurt you. And he's like, OK. Then this team bursts in and starts shooting up the place and killing people, killing security guards, just murdering everyone. They pull the scientists out and they're all like, no, it's we're scientists. We're unarmed. What is it? What do you want? And they, they go to him and go, oh, are you Dr. Obrachev? I'm like, uh, yes. And he's like, Great. Good. Get me this thing out of the get me the, you know, the the weapon or whatever it is out of the thing. And Obrachev says, well, it's it's too it's double encrypted. And he goes, OK, great. Pick one of the other people then. And he gestures to Hugh Dennis's character. And the other scientist is yelling at, at the both of them. She's like, don't don't give it to them. Don't let them. You can't let them take this. And then they all get killed. Yep. So then Obrachev and Dr. Hardy, Hugh Dennis's character, get out whatever this thing is. And then he gets killed. So it's just Obrachev left. <laughs> it's, it's a bit grim. So they have whatever this thing is and they make their escape. And the way they make their escape 
It's kind, it's kind of, great. of great. It's kind of great. They have they open up an elevator shaft. They have this giant thing. It looks like a cartoon atomic bomb, and they drop it down the elevator shaft. And as it's falling, it fires a bunch of pitons out to the sides of the elevator shaft that all have these illuminated lights on them. And then it hits the bottom of the shaft and blows a hole through the basement. And then they all put on these suits. They put and they put Oberchef in a suit, like a vest thing that powers on, also with LED lights. And then they all just jump into the elevator shaft, and they're on like a very high. <laughs> floor of this thing and he's like no i can't what what are you doing no and because they're all it's magnets and so they have like the repulsor magnets on their thing and the magnets are now surrounding the elevator shaft so they get slowed down until it's safe for them to drop and it's that's i love this as a bond movie gadget because it's one of those things that's like i'm confident that's bullshit but <laughs> but maybe maybe it's not yeah maybe it seems it's not plausible i could you know i you know, maybe that it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm we like propel things with magnetism, and presumably we slow things with magnetism on rails. We have trains that operate that way. Yeah, maybe this works. It's plausible. Yeah, I'm like, all right. Yeah, I, I can, I can see that. <laughs> On their way out, they detonate the entire lab and blow it out. And so there's this really cool wide shot of London with just this one window on a office building going. And then we cut to MI6, where Money Penny, once again played by Naomi Harris, bursts into M's office, once again, M played by Ray Fiennes, and is like, hey, we have a problem here. And he's also like, they've just been informed at the same moment. He's like, yep, I know, I'm just looking at it now. And he pulls up a thing and this, you know, whatever this project is, Project Heracles, something terrible has happened. And Money Penny is like, what's, what is Heracles? And he's like, don't worry about it. Uh, I'll handle this. And she's like, okay, cool. Do you want me to? It was ghastly. Yeah. Do you want me to alert the prime minister? No, it's that I'll handle it. And it's like, that's that's suspicious. So there's one thing about this scene that gets me every time. And it's only mm -hmm. upon like going through it frame by frame that it became obvious to me what is going on here because it's less than a second of screen time. But when Naomi Harris or when Money Penny busts into M's office, she says, sir, I've just received the most unusual report. And he says, I've seen it. Right. But because of the way they've like got him, he's reclined on the couch in his office and he's got a newspaper that he puts down. And like as she busts in, it looks like he's just chilling there reading yeah. the news yeah. and says, I've seen it. And then he turns on the TV and gets the report. Right. Yeah. It's like, oh, money pennies here. I better look busy. How could you possibly have already seen it if you were reading the newspaper and you only learn about the details by turning on the TV that I've seen it doesn't make sense. But looking at it in super slow motion, he's got his phone up. And so he's like already putting down the paper and is looking at his phone where he's received the notification on his phone. Mm -hmm. And then he puts his phone down and turns on the TV to get the full report. And so like it does not read very well at full speed <laughs> no you didn't see it at all you're just looking busy also how come someone pinged it directly to m and not via money penny <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't Anyhow, it's like a stupid nitpicky thing that doesn't matter, but yeah. uh, it just gets me every time. I thought the same thing when I saw it. I was like, wait, what? What do you mean you've already, what? Yeah. No, I thought exactly the same thing. At the end of the scene, M says, where is 007? And then it hard cuts to Bond on a boat somewhere in the Bahamas, having gone fishing. It's a good boat. Nice boat. He must still have a lot of money squirreled away. <laughs> and he returns home with, yeah, two big fish to this like amazing coastal abode where he's been, I guess, hiding off the grid. I mean, se semi off the grid because he immediately notices that there's cigar ash that has been left behind. And then eventually he goes and finds one of the cigars. I don't know if the implication is that the cigar has been left or if it was his that someone came in and smoked, but I think it was the first one. I think it was someone brought it in, smoked it and yes. left it there on purpose. Definitely that is the case. I love this. What a heck of a detail. He looks at it and the kind of cigar is a delectado, which if you recall from Die Another Day, basically <laughs> our favorite scene in Die Another Day was the bit where Bond is doing actual like spy stuff in Cuba and he goes into that factory floor and asks for the delectados and they're like, no, no, we don't make those anymore. We haven't made them in years. And he's like, ask your boss that someone's here looking for the delectados. And he gets on the phone and is like, okay, he says go upstairs. And it turns out that the guy who runs the cigar place is like a embedded agent for MI6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because they're not they're not a real they're not a thing that exists like they're not a real well i think i think it's one of those things where they didn't exist but they do now because of bond 
<laughs> right. But yeah, I just, I thought that was a, a neat touch that it's not just that someone's left a cigar there. It's particularly a delectado, which means the bond is like, oh, okay. I, I know who this is. <laughs> yeah. And so he drives into town. <laughs> yeah. And who does he immediately come across? <laughs> None other than Felix Leiter. Yay. Who showed up at his place and smoked a cigar and left it behind. I didn't realize that Lighter, of course, hadn't been in Skyfall or Spectre. Right. This is Jeffrey Wright returning to the role after 12 years. It's been that long? (laughs) God, I am old. (laughs) Yeah. (sighs) This is also, he's he's now the only actor who's played Felix Lighter three times. (laughs) Also, every Bond film that's had a section in the Bahamas has also had Felix in it. Right. Because that's just, that's where he hangs out. I guess just in this movie universe, that's his assignment. But no, no, like going all the way back. Oh. Bond hasn't gone to the Bahamas necessarily that often, given the breadth of the franchise, but any movie in the Bahamas also has Felix in it. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Jeffrey Wright is back as Felix Leiter. And who's with him? It's a guy named Logan Ash. Oh, that's right. Logan Ash. Played by B- Billy Magnuson. Does a good job of being a schmuck. Oh man, what a schmuck. Again, well cast. What a punchable face this guy has. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> They're trying to be like Bond and Lighter are trying to be cool because Lighter is like, hey, I want to pull you back into the game. There's this guy and shows him a picture of Ubrachev. And he shows him the picture and Lighter's like, you're going to say you've never heard of him. And Bond goes, I've never heard of him because they're obviously just sort of, you know, like they're playing. And Logan Ash is like, how can you say you've never heard of him? He's this guy. He's, you know, you must know about this guy. Didn't he while you were in MI6? Yeah. And it's like, you just imagine Felix is like, shut up. You're embarrassing me. (laughs) Apparently he was a political appointee. He's from the State Department. Yeah. Which definitely must be driving lighter up the wall. Anyway, Bond, after making eyes with a waitress, is like, I'm not going to do this. Goodbye. Sorry, I'm not interested because this guy defected to England and now has skipped town and the CIA wants him brought in, but they're not talking to MI6. And Bond's like, mm, I don't like that. You you have fun. I've, I'm have i retired. Goodbye. Yeah. Speaking of which, this is what? The, the fourth consecutive Bond movie where Bond is retired and coming out of retirement? Oh, man. Like, ugh. It, you're right. You know, this is this is what we've we've banged on this drum so many times, or punched a hole through this drum. But like in Casino Royale, it's him being promoted to double O status, and then from then on, every movie is like one last ride. Yeah, <laughs> if you must make it an arc. God, if you must, and start with that with Casino Royale, that he's just becoming a double O, and then have have the last movie be like coming back out of retirement. But let the three in the middle just have him be Bond. (laughs) (laughs) I'm with you. So he tries to leave. He tries to head back to his place, but his truck won't turn on. And the waitress he was making eyes at comes by in a scooter and is like, do you need a lift? And he's like, yeah, all right, sure, why not? So she gives him a ride back to his place and is very quickly like, oh, is this the bedroom? And she heads in there and he's like, well, okay. And he walks in after her and she removes her wig. To a great quip from Bond. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's not the first thing I thought you were going to take off, but all right. It should be mentioned also, as an aside, Primo, aka Cyclops, was also in that bar. Yes. In fact, there's like a lot of stuff going on here because on the woman is Lashana Lynch. She has been tailing Bond all through this series of scenes taking place in the Bahamas. So when Bond drives into town, he passes a motorbike with some speakers on it, and she is standing next to the bike watching him drive by before he's even met up. Wow, I missed that. Yeah, so she's on the side of the road watching him drive into town. Then there's the whole thing with Felix. She's in the bar. Cyclops is in the bar. Then Bond goes out, finds his truck broken down, and she drives up and offers him a ride. So, like, everybody is in the mix here. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because it turns out that she is, in fact, working for MI6. In fact, as Bond very quickly surmises, he says, you're a double O. Like, he just instantly is like, oh, okay, I I see what's going on here. You're you're a double O. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I am. So this is 007. This is the new 007. Now, I don't know how you felt about this, but let me let me explain an issue I have with her characterization, because overall, go for it. Overall, I quite like her. But they do this thing with the number 007, where she's like, by the way, you didn't ask what number I am. It's 
007. I bet you would have thought they'd retired it after you. He responds, he's like, it's just a number. And I think the intent was for us to feel like Bond is actually bothered by that. But the way that Craig sells it tells me that he truly doesn't give a shit. Right. And through the whole movie, 007, or Nomi, as her character's name is, keeps needling him about this until eventually, just before the final act, she's like, hey, M, I would like to ask you to redesignate Bond as 007. And he he doesn't give a shit. Yeah. I think the intent was that it's supposed to be she's being cool about it slash poking the bear and that Bond is supposed to be annoyed by this. And then eventually she comes to realize, no, wait, this guy's actually great and he he can have his he can have his number and I'm OK with that. But what it comes across to me like is that she's just being needlessly shitty and that Bond truly doesn't care. And at the end, when she's like, no, no, you should have this. That's it comes across to me like that's that's for her conscience. And I don't think that was actually intended. Yeah. So there's one other layer to this that you've sort of neglected to mention, which is that when Bond gets reinstated as a double O, but not double O seven, M is like, I'm reinstating you as a double O. And and she immediately goes, which one? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what, like what what number? number and then it comes up again later on like she asks again like but what number this whole back and forth should just not be in the movie or if they d- it should have been done completely differently i agree i think there is like a cute way to do this but it, mm-hmm. you have to do it in a way that doesn't have her being like needlessly shitty to bond because they're playing it in a way that like she's insecure about the number and so she values the number and she is insecure about the sort of the legacy she's having to live up to and her character growth is like giving the number away at the end of the movie but it's such a nothing thing like yeah it's just such a nothing thing and the like turning around and being like i'm the new 007 and i bet that bothers you doesn't it it's just like no just just play it cool just be like, you know, I'm a double O and then have it come up. And if you want to make a thing of it, have Bond initiate the reaction, right? Just have her play it cool. It's like, oh yeah, I'm the new 007, whatever. And Bond can either care or not, or can pretend like he doesn't care, but actually does a bit and is a little miffed by it. Or she's playing it cool, but she's actually really insecure about the legacy of the number. And so like she's protective of it in a way, but not shitty about it. It just makes her feel like a needlessly sort of unsympathetic character early in the movie which is a real shame because i think she's great and i'd I'd love to have her come back in future movies Yeah, I totally agree, because I like the idea of having them at odds. Like, certainly she should be like, whoa, we're we're bringing this old dinosaur back into active duty. I don't think that's a good idea. And like, have them be at odds. That's fine. But for her character growth, as you say, for the culmination of her arc to be handing the number back over sucks because Bond undercut that as being a necessary arc to have by believably going, I don't care it's just a number yeah i i don't know it, it further bugs me with the whole like we're bringing lashana lynch in as the first female 007 I'm like okay cool yeah sure i had no problem with it bond is not gonna be 007 at the end of this movie so having the number move to a new agent is cool and having him just be a like an undesignated 00 with reactivated into the service and making a few jokes about like oh but, but which one on nomi's part is funny and it's cute it's like a nice bit Right. And having them have a rivalry potentially around the number is a nice bit, but play it fun. Just don't make a thing of it. (laughs) Right. She's the first female 007. Cool. That's awesome. That's just cool. It makes sense. Like the numbers move from agent to agent. Cool. Great. I'm, I'm all for it. But then like having her make a thing of it in the movie just makes it really unsympathetic. And it draws attention to the fact that like the filmmakers think they're doing a thing that needs recognizing. <laughs> yeah. It almost feels like they're needling the audience. Like this bothers you, doesn't it? Yeah. But no, it doesn't bother me. I think it's great. <laughs> I think yeah. it's a good idea. Just just do it and don't make a big deal about it. And that will be way better. <laughs> Anyhow, she says in this scene, hey, by the way, I'm going to do that thing for MI6, so stay out of my way. And Bond's like, okay, I don't want to do this. And you can tell M I don't work for him. And she chucks him a phone and is like, you can tell him yourself. And it's like, you, you, what about what I just said makes you think that I want this? <laughs> 
you really get the impression that Bond is like, no, seriously, actually, will you go away? But what? how does he find out that there's a connection to Spectre? Because that's what pulls him back in. Logan is tells it... him. That was why they tried to re-enlist oh. him. MI6 is wrapped up in this, and it's a defected British asset. And best of all, Spectre's involved. You're right. the perfect man for the job. Right. And of course, we'll find out later why. Of course, Logan would be the one to be like, hey, Spectre's involved, eh? Yeah. Anyway, 007, Nomi, leaves, makes that quip, which we've talked about, Chuck's bond to phone. And he's like, okay, I will, goodbye. Please leave me alone. Back at MI6, dimly lit, dingy basement MI6. <laughs> I guess Q prefers low lights. They're trying to figure out what's on the hard drives of Dr. Obrachev. And uh, they're pretty thrapped and burned and destroyed. So there's a bunch of files missing, but he's going to keep on working at it. When Tanner, once again played by Rory Kinnear, gets a phone call. It's Bond. <laughs> I love that the like when M gets the phone, he's expecting Nomi. Yeah. Because it's Nobi's phone is like, yes, 007. And Bond introduces himself and he's like, oh, Bond? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do you have this phone? Yeah, exactly. Bond just gets confirmation that this is MI6's mess. Is like really all it comes down to is he's like, hey, I met your new 007. She's lovely. What have you done? Yeah. What did you do? By the way, I'm not helping you clean it up. But Spectre's involved, so that's a problem. M is like, well, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think Spectre's involved because Blofeld is still in prison. Yeah. And, and he hangs up on Bond. As soon as Bond needles him, he hangs up on him immediately, which basically gives Bond the like confirmation he needs. It's like, what have you done and he gets hung up on i think that's basically what finally puts the nail in the coffin of bond's unwillingness to do this he's like now his interest is peaked mm -hmm. so he calls up felix and is like hey guess what they do actually take a quick look at a live audio feed of blofeld in belmarsh prison where he's just sort of like he's speaking in tongues basically he's just sort of babbling incoherently and they're like Okay, I guess Blofeld's fine. Because Bond telling M was the first that M had heard that Spectre might be involved. And so M's like, wait, let me check in on Blofeld. And Blofeld's babbling. And he's like, okay, that was a lie. Or that was not true. All right, whatever. Then Bond has a moment of introspection and calls up Felix and is like, I'm back in the game. Except he doesn't actually ever talk like that. <laughs> So he heads over to Cuba. As he pulls up with his boat, he sees 007 getting off of a seaplane. They wave at one another across the dock. They're like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> well, she waves at him anyway, and he's just like, oh, this will be fun. And it will be. And it will be. This is far and away the best sequence in the movie. Mm -hmm. Way too short, and I want more of it. Yeah. More, more of this, please. This whole, the, the next 15 or 20 minutes are awesome. Mm -hmm. Bond meets up with Paloma, who's a CIA agent waiting for him at a soda shop or whatever, played by Ana de Armas who was in Knives Out with Daniel Craig, which is how she's here because Craig suggested her for this role based on working with her in Knives oh, Out. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. She is wearing a dress with a V down to her navel and leg slits up to her waist <laughs> and presumably so much tape. <laughs> <laughs> I read some anecdote about like, we wanted to make sure that it was going to be something that you could feasibly wear to a black tie cocktail night, but also be, you know, wouldn't like restrict your movement as a secret agent. And it's like, yes, that's definitely why you put her in this costume. <laughs> She's great. Uh, there's a scene. She's like, okay, cool. You're late. Great. Come on. Come with me. <laughs> she takes him downstairs and he's like, is this your room? She's like, no, it's the wine cellar and pulls him inside and starts like taking his shirt off. And he's like, well, I, surely we should get to know each other better. And she's like, oh, that's, oh, no, mm, no, that's not what the, I, I got you a, a suit. How about you? How about you put on the suit? And he's like, all right, cool. And <laughs> I love that she, she has this moment and this look on her face of like, oh, <laughs> it's like you are, you are too old for me, dude. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah, it's very it's, good. I, I like Bond's like smile through the whole thing. She tells him that she's only had three weeks training. <laughs> yes. And he's like, oh, this is going to go fabulously. And, and so he's like, oh, OK, I get it. You got me a suit. And then she's standing there watching him put it on. And he's like, would you turn around? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I like that he doesn't look the least bit put out by her rebuffing him. He's like, yeah, all right. Okay, cool. I, that that tracks. You know, he's yeah. he's not like, I'm annoyed. 
So no, just very amused by the whole situation. It's great. Yeah. Why are they actually here? Because there's a party. There is a party. And they believe that Obrachev is going to be there. That's the reason. Paloma is a CIA asset in Cuba. Felix's contact. They have evidence that Obrachev is going to be at this party, and, and so they're going to infiltrate it. Bond orders them a vodka martini, shaken, not stirred. Paloma absolutely demolishes her immediately, and then, and then is, like, <laughs> is like, great, let's go. You know, she's like really eager to get going. So then we get a little scene with Obrachev and and Primo. And what's happening here, Primo has a DNA sample of Bond. We assume that he got it at that bar in the Bahamas. He's given it to Obrachev, who is using it to encode some kind of weapon. So we have to assume that it's some kind of genetic weapon or whatever. But while Obrachev is setting it up, he fakes fumbling the USB key, pulls that other one that he recently <laughs> swallowed and presumably passed, out of his sock and plugs that one in. And there's a thing where we can see the computer screen that it is now encoding multiple DNA profiles into whatever this weapon is. And he gives Primo a little vial. Primo takes the vial and plugs it into the like environmental system of this place so that it's injected into like, we find out later, like sprayers, basically. So we, we don't know exactly what's happening, but this thing is like, you know, it's very clear. It's like multiple profiles encoded, weaponized. It's online. So, you know, we know that this is something is going on. So Bond and Paloma are wandering around the party where Bond notices that this is like a who's who of Spectre agents. It's not strictly speaking an orgy, but it's like a big debauched cocktail party. <laughs> Mm -hmm. with like a bunch of Spectre agents and young girls just sort of messing around. Not all the Spectre agents are men, by the way. Right. Uh, in fact, I have the note here on the Wikipedia page that Brigitte Millar reprises her role as Spectre Chief Dr. Vogel from Spectre. I don't oh. recall her from that, but here we are. <laughs> well, good to know. Yeah. Paloma spots that there's this guy, <laughs> like this Adam's Family lurch looking character, <laughs> except bald, walking around with a small purple tufted pillow. It looks like like it's made out of an old crown royal bag it's purple it's great velvet with gold trim upon which is resting a cybernetic eyeball he's walking around and showing it to the guests and they're like raising their glass to it or bowing to it Bond and Paloma's radio earpieces start to bleed in with this radio signal where they can hear Blofeld talking. And it becomes apparent that what's happening is Blofeld is talking to everyone at Spectre, because they're all wearing earpieces as well, that he's observing everything through this eye. And Bond also notices that Primo is there. So it's like he's hosting a party in Cuba from Belmarsh Prison. Mm -hmm. As the scene continues, Bond starts observing this more closely, and then it sounds more and more like Blofeld is talking to him personally. Personally. And then there's just this great sort of build where Bond realizes that everyone has now stopped what they're doing and boxed him in and is watching him and what is happening. And Bond's like, wait, what the heck's going on here? And then Blofeld eventually is like, we now get to see the end of my brother, James Bond. And the lights go down and a spotlight hits Bond. And it's like, ha ha. And he's like in the middle of the room, perfectly centered on a pattern on the floor. Very, very well put together. Mm -hmm. And then the sprayers kick off and a bunch of stuff mists into the room. And Blofeld is like, oh, don't worry, everybody. By the way, this is totally harmless to us. It'll only be lethal to Bond is what Blofeld says. But then everyone from Spectre starts dying and gruesomely. Yeah. Boils forming on their faces and like weeping blood. And it's only the Spectre people. And just to just to hammer it home. <laughs> Just in case anybody was unclear at this point, we do get a shot of Obrachev gleefully watching this going like, oh, it's working. Only Spectre is dying. <laughs> Which I, I don't know that was necessarily needed, but it's like, okay, I guess let's sell it to the cheap seats. Right. I love the the confusion. Obrachev, as everybody is dying, he's starting now to look around to see who's still standing, right? And he's, he spots Paloma and is like, oh, hello, are, are you my escort? And she just gives him this like, what? Look. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no. Uh oh. And turns to run. <laughs> <laughs> and then our action scene begins yeah, as yeah. Uh, as chaos ensues. So Bond spots Oberchev making a getaway and uh, and runs after him, grabs the martini on a, on a tray, wings it like a frisbee at the back of Oberchev's head, knocking him to the ground, and then drinks the martini. <laughs> 
and then the gunfight starts. All, all hell breaks loose. Bond manages to retrieve a USB key from Oberchev just before Nomi crashes through the ceiling on a like repelling rig, <laughs> grabs Oberchev and retreats back out through the ceiling. Paloma and Bond start shooting their way through this party as Bond gives chase to Nomi to try and get Oberchev, Oberchev back in hand. I appreciate that, you know, Nomi is supremely capable and only doesn't manage to do this perfectly because Bond is actively <laughs> screwing with her. Yeah. <laughs> Because he doesn't want, he's highly suspicious about the fact that MI6 and the CIA both want this guy, but aren't working together. Right. So he's like, eh, I think there's, there's other people at play here. Very cool gunfight action sequence. I like the shot of Paloma fighting a bunch of dudes that's, it's shot down from above. Everyone's on the ground because after a, mm -hmm. after a fist fight, everyone, including her is on the ground and she sort of spins around on her hip shooting them. Yeah. That's a great shot. I love the fact that we never really find out Paloma's deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Bond is like, really? Three weeks training, huh? And she's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She murders the hell out of half of Spectre. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way it's three weeks training. Yeah. And and like she's playing this really sort of extremely nervous rookie agent with three weeks training. But we, we never find out if it's an act or not, other than the fact that she just whips an enormous amount of ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they briefly pause to each have a drink and then back to it. Obrachev asks 007 where she's taking him. And she says, back to mother, darling. And he knows that that means England. And she's like, oh, mother, no, oh. Uh, uh, and starts trying to get away from <laughs> her while she's under fire and climbs onto essentially a scaffold, which allows Paloma to just barrel a car directly into it, knocking it to the ground and allowing them to then get away with Obrachev while leaving Nomi to deal with the police, which, of course, she handily evades immediately because she's a double O. Right. So after a nice little goodbye exchange between Bond and Paloma, they were like, boy, you were excellent. Hey, thanks. You were good, too. You know, swing by, swing by Cuba <laughs> yeah, again sometime. let's do this again sometime. Time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Bond said before leaving 007, Bond was like, I'm going to borrow your plane. <laughs> <laughs> so he steals her plane and then they uh, fly away and rendezvous with Felix and Logan Ash on a boat in the middle of the ocean. Over the course of this scene on the boat where it's just Bond, Lighter, Ash, and Obrachev, Bond is like, okay, what is this? <laughs> what is this weapon that you have? And Obrachev is like, I know, isn't it great? It, it, it only, they were, wanted to kill you, but I switched it. So it only killed Spectre. Wasn't that awesome? And he's like, no, shut up. What is it? <laughs> Who told you to do this? What the hell? Because Obrachev thinks Bond knows way more than he does. Mm -hmm. As Bond is grilling Obrachev, Logan Ash keeps yelling like, you're you stop this line of questioning. You don't have to, hey, Obrachev, you don't have to answer him because he's like, I don't know, trying to be a, a lawyer for the guy. I don't know. I guess like you're supposed to assume that he's like really concerned about Obrachev's Miranda rights or I don't know. Well, uh, that or just like Bond is not actually in the employ of the US. And so it's like he doesn't have clearance to know this information. His job was just to go get yeah. Obrachev and bring him back. Anyway, Lighter is like, Ash, shut up. I want to hear what Bond's doing. And eventually it's like, how did he know I would be there. And Obrachev glances at Logan Ash. And then Ash is like, ugh. And then goes to pull out a gun. And Lighter's like, whoa, wait. And then they have a struggle. Lighter gets shot. Ash and Bond have a struggle. Bond ends up being hurled down the stairs to the lower deck of the boat where Felix has also fallen down. And then Ash and Obrachev get away in the plane, also blowing up the boat behind them as they go. There's some very nice dialogue here with Bond and Lighter because they've been, you know, they've been friends for so long and i like the lighters like i want to get back to my family in somewhere he says somewhere specific and bond is like what you're from milwaukee and lighters like, oh yeah is that what i told you <laughs> there there are two different bits there's i want to go back home to my family and tell them that i saved the world again which he says when he's right. trying to recruit bond and then yeah. he's like oh this reminds me of those days on the shrimp boat in louisiana and bond's like you're from milwaukee <laughs> And yeah, then he's like, oh, is that what I told you? I, yeah. I don't even remember anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I think my favorite line from this bit is, is he's like sitting on the floor holding his stomach, like this bleeding gunshot wound from his stomach. He's like, I don't know about you, but I got a feeling in my gut that Ash isn't on our side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just a good quip. This is very good. Very sadly, Felix does not 
make it out of this, which is yeah. a shame. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing License to Kill again. We're doing Felix Leiter dying again. So the end result is Bond sitting in a lifeboat with a cigar that he had got for Felix through the course of the previous action scene, just sort of sitting there and eventually he gets picked up by a big freighter. And then we cut back to London where there's Bond picking up a different other newer Aston Martin from his garage. <laughs> this one's a Vanquish, isn't it? Yeah. This is the, the Vanquish V8. There's a shot. There's like five different Aston Martins in this movie. Because there was a very futuristic looking one in a wind tunnel at MI6 that oh, yeah. M was standing in front of. I love that M's like, I have a phone call. One second, I'm just going to duck into the wind tunnel for privacy. I love that the car is internally lit with a red light. <laughs> that is cool. There's a the shot in the garage in London opens with that bulldog in the foreground. The one from Judy mm-hmm. Dench's M's desk in the foreground i just i I like that and there's this really interesting shot where we see bond on one side of the car and then the camera moves it pans to the other side of the car as bond closes the door to get into it it doesn't make sense temporally and this isn't the only time in the movie where bond will like sort of teleport and i i think that's just a way that fukunaga likes to shoot things just for like a to conserve time right because like he's oh, yeah. on the, he's on the left side of the car and the camera pans and then he's also closing the right hand driver's door. Yeah, his his head is in two places simultaneously in that shot. Yeah, it's a neat little way of sort of just keeping the energy of the scene along. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. Also, that scene definitely didn't need to be there. <laughs> no, but I assume that was that was for Aston Martin's benefit. He's got his car. The Bond theme is playing, you know, bound home down. Oh, he's in London. He's got a suit and everything. He's pulling up to MI6. And then he walks up to the uh, security desk <laughs> where the man asks him name, please Bond. And then the guy just stares at him. James Bond uh, yeah, and types it in. <laughs> <laughs> and then it cuts to him wearing a visitor badge and Money Penny flicking the visitor badge. I gotta say, very similar energy. Bond at MI6 with a visitor badge. Picard at Starfleet Academy with a visitor badge. Yeah. <laughs> right. Similar energy, which I'm I'm here for it. I like it. Yeah. So he goes in, 007 spots him and is like, hi, what the hell happened there? I'm like, you lost Obrichev and you're working for the CIA? And he's like, yeah, well, you know, funny about that. Anyway, I'm going to go into CM now. And Money Penny's like, oh, a 007, you actually can't go in. This is just for Bond and M right now. And <laughs> right, this is where Bond gets to snip back a little bit. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Does that bother you? <laughs> and then sits down and there. this line was in the trailers, but I do appreciate it with 007 saying to Money Penny, oh, I can see why you shot him. And Money Penny goes, yeah, well, everyone tries at least once. Just <laughs> like this insufferable man. Yeah. And then then we get this sequence of Bond just being in just a colossal asshole to M. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not unjustifiably no but it is hilarious <laughs> mm-hmm. i don't know one one of my one of my problems with this movie i think is not really inherent to the movie so much as it is inherent to the franchise as a whole but it really feels like m has had a really inconsistently written character between the last movie and this one because mm. part of what gets me is like the last several movies have all been about how like the spy game has changed right and how like we used to be able to get in a room with our enemies but now they just float in the ether and we can't see them they lurk in the shadows and we need these like ultra weapons and surveillance technologies to to be able to deal with this ever-present ethereal threat and a no we literally have an organization of people (laughs) <laughs> named Spectre <laughs> doing evil plots that are people that Bond literally got in a room with not five minutes ago, but also like in the last movie, Ray finds M's whole thing was no he was a soldier he understands the day-to-day fight of the rank and file on the ground in the trenches he understands the benefit of an individual asset that can be deployed and then in this movie is like you know i for the last 10 years i've been working on this super weapon that we can just infect the world with and have it only kill the people we want to kill <laughs> And like his whole thing last time around was like, oh, no, this surveillance technology is much too dangerous for Great Britain to have. Nobody should have this much power over information. And then this time around, it's like, no, we're going to just build a a world ending threat on the Queen's dime. I have a real problem with that. (laughs) 
it doesn't help that like as you say since skyfall certainly they've been really hammering on this like it's in the shadows we can't see them we don't know what that is and that has never been shown to be the case in the movies yeah because <laughs> bond has always come face to face with these people because that makes for a bad movie yeah <laughs> right bond solves cyber crime is not a good movie so it's like, yeah, okay, I, I, you, you say that, but that's not actually what you're doing in these movies. Right. And I like to a certain extent, that's okay in the movies because the thesis of the films is always comes around to like, no, there is a place for Bond. They keep asking and answering the same question. Like the movies yeah. have to, in order to justify the continuance of the franchise, they have to come back to like, no, there is a place for Bond. Bond does have to get into the room with the people and put a gun in their face. And this movie does the same thing, right? Like it's still the world ending threat has to be stopped and it takes Bond to do it. But I just like, I don't like the flip in character of M from the last movie. He was like, no, we need the double O's. The double O's are important. And the Oculus system that we're putting together is a bad idea or whatever it was called. And this one where it's like, no, actually, we need to not use double O's and we need to use this global biological weapon that I have been developing for a decade in secret. Yeah. <laughs> And it just feels like this is not the same M. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Bond is like giving him the gears about this thing, this like super weapon that he developed. And M is like, he's taking it a little bit because I mean, he did do that, but he's also, also wants Bond to shut up and just help him. And he's like, look, thanks for your help. Thanks again for your help. But if you don't want to keep helping, then bugger off. Basically, Bond is like, I want to talk to Blofeld. And M's like, what? Why? And like, because he ran a party. He hosted a party in Cuba from Belmarsh Prison. So that's the free information that he's giving to M. Yeah. But M doesn't want to let Bond do anything else. So Bond's like, all right, cool. See you later. Goodbye. And on the way out of the building, Money Penny comes up to him and is like, hey, what uh, are you doing for dinner? And Bond's like, huh? And then we cut to Q's house. Oh, actually, on his way out, I appreciate that he takes off his visitor badge and... <laughs> tosses it across the room into the garbage bin. It's such bin a good shot. In the same way that he used to throw his bowler hat onto the onto the hat rack. It's so good. I like that shot a lot. Mm -hmm. So Q is at home preparing dinner for a date. As Q says, he'll be here any moment. But unfortunately, who is actually at the door is Bond and Moneypenny, which Q is not happy to see. <laughs> Q also has a hairless sphinx cat, which Bond quips, you know, they come with fur now. I like that he has to dispatch the cat to like elsewhere in the house twice over the course of the scene. I think it's like three times, isn't it? Like, yeah, he sends it up the stairs once. He puts it in the backyard the second time. He like, takes it off the table and puts it in the backyard. Yeah. The cat's just like, I'm in your way. I'm in your way. So <laughs> while they're also drinking his wine, they're so rude. <laughs> As Q points out, well, I guess it was never a nine to five, was it? Bond has that USB stick that Paloma got from Obrachev in Cuba because he didn't give that to M. So Q wants to figure out what's on it. It turns out what's on it is all of the missing files from those hard drives that he was trying to recover. And in fact, it is basically DNA sequences for God, like everybody in the world, practically. You know, right. It may as well be everybody in the world. That's how Obrachev used it to make this Heracles is the name of the weapon. That's how he managed to make it only hit the people in Spectre and not Bond and not any of the other people. And so he's got all the DNA for like all of the secret, you know, like MI6 or any any secret agents around the world. But it seems like he has basically everybody and they have like a super weapon that they could just use to kill anybody that they want at any time. I don't know if it's here or later that we will find out. And this made me audibly sigh <laughs> in the theater. <laughs> This is not a chemical weapon. These are nanobots. 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 Colonel. Nanobots. Nanobots. Nanomachines. It's Metal Gear Solid now. Yeah. There's one shot in this scene that, on the one hand, I like it because it's cute. On the other hand, it's very much in the, the wheelhouse of, like, Bond movies responding to criticism of previous Bond movies, mm -hmm. where Q gets the USB stick and he goes over to his computer to analyze it and then has a second thought about it and says, Bond, where has this been? And Bond is like, well, everywhere, I imagine. He's like, okay, into the sandbox it goes, which is, like, a direct response to what he did in Skyfall right where he like infected the mi6 systems by just putting the usb key into a network connected computer and it's like they didn't need to put that there 
I like, like, I kind of like that they did. <laughs> I kinda, yeah, I kind of like that Q learned his lesson, you know? But, uh, yeah. They got flack for, it's like, why would their IT professional not do that in the first place? And so now they're, like, All making right, a fair. thing of it. But anyhow, it's just, it's like, it's a cute bit. But I don't know. I could go either way on it. I think it's cute. I think it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> I think I come around on like liking it, but it's definitely a scene that's there for the the meta yeah. as opposed to the the actual needs of the film. M had also assigned 007 to get into Belmarsh, search it up and down, search Blofeld's cell. He says, search the whole man. And she's like, great, I'll get my gloves. At the end of this scene, Bond says, I need to talk to Blofeld. And they're like, well, only one person gets to talk to Blofeld. It's the only person he'll talk to is his psychiatrist. And it's like, who is that? Cut to Madeline Swan walking to work. She's a psychologist and she has a new client that wants to talk to her. And the person letting her know this is like, he's kind of weird. And she's like, you can't say that. <laughs> like, it's true. Professional setting. Like, hey, there's a new new nutcase wants to talk to you. Like, Jesus, Sharon, shut up. You can't. That's so unprofessional. As it turns out, this man who is collecting a piece of her hair as she walks in the room, unbeknownst to her, is played by Rami Malek spoilers this is the guy from before i guess theoretically we're not supposed to know this except that it's in all the trailers yeah um that it's the same person as before but this is lucifer safin lucifer 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 that, that sounds correct yeah so they have a scene here where she's like all right cool so i guess you're my new you're you need some help like what's up let's you know like let's talk about this this is essentially, this is one of his two Bond villain monologues here. And I'm trying to remember the yes. gist of this one. The gist of this one is, so the outcome of the scene is that he's going to get Madeline to do a favor for him. And the favor is that she's going to go visit Blofeld wearing a perfume that he provides her. And we we can intuit from the scene that the perfume he provides her is Heracles targeting Blofeld. Yeah. The monologue that he gives is about how he lost his family when they were young, when he was young, and that kind of loss is traumatic for a child. And Madeline agrees because she's also lost her, like, lost her family, well, lost her mother when she was young, and so they sort of, like, bond a little bit back and forth over that. Then he has this monologue about how he saved a life once, and he thinks that's had had a more profound effect on his life because when you save somebody's life, you bind yourself to them, and they belong to you and then he sort of cuts himself off and he says i i'm not very good at talking about myself so i brought a memory box he hands the memory box to madeline she opens it and it's the broken mask inside the box and so she then realizes that the person she's speaking to is the man who attacked her home when she was a child and ostensibly saved her from drowning in ice but yes i mean put her in that situation to begin with but also spared her yeah and so this of course then contextualizes what he's just said where he's menacing her into doing a favor for him he's like i saved your life once and now you owe me so what you're gonna do is you're gonna go visit blofeld while wearing this perfume and it's harmless to you but you're gonna do this for me because i saved your life in the past and that's that's the like the thrust of this scene the one thing that they that is like super weird about this scene just because we don't have context for it yet at the very beginning when she walks into the office he has one of her hairs and he's like playing with it between his fingers and then he curls it up and folds it into a handkerchief and puts it away when he sees her come in mm -hmm. that'll come up later yeah also i assume it happens off camera but it is implied that the only reason she's doing it is because he's threatening bond because he basically you know like threatens her and she's like you killed my mother and he's like well your dad killed my whole family so you know fair dues <laughs> you got me there he even says like parents right she's like look there's nothing you can do to me everybody that i've ever loved or cared about is dead and he's like oh that's so sad but it's also not true and so the implication is that he then informs her that bond is alive and he is aware of that and that she has to do this or he'll kill bond is i assume what happens that is what happens in the scene and that is the implications of this scene given the context we have been provided by the movie to this point yeah so then we get a scene with Mallory out on the Thames and Bond comes up to him. Presumably he's been invited to be here. Mallory's like, well, so we looked into it and it turns out, yeah, Blofeld had a robotic eye that he was using to conduct Spectre business from inside Belmarsh. So egg on my face. Great job, Bond. Thanks. And I do appreciate there's this moment where Bond's like, yes, we also figured out this, this and this. And M's like, who's we? Oh, crap. Like he he, <laughs> he drops an F-bomb. <laughs> oh, he does. He says, oh, for fuck's sake. Right. He says, who's we? And then immediately realizes he must be talking about Money, Penny, and Q and answers his own questions. Just is like, oh, yeah. dang it. 
So I like my that. favorite part of this whole scene is actually it is a musical reference to OHMSS. Yes. Which is that the score providing the backtrack for this scene is the theme song from OHMSS. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because he is being reinstated. He is once again on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah, I really like that one. It's subtle. It's not like right in your face, but it's like that's a cute little callback that I think is really well done. I, I noticed it in theater on my first watch through and I'm like, ah, yes, I do watch the movies good. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a Bond or two in my time. Yeah. yeah, no, that was good. I like that reference a lot more than I liked pulling all the time in the world earlier. Fair enough. Bond is still needling M, but M's a little bit more like, yeah, okay, yes. I I mean, like, here's why. Here are my reasons. Here's why I did it. You make a good point, Bond. Okay, fine. I effed up, you know, so it, I think the scene goes okay. So now they're back at MI6. Bond's been reinstated, but at what number? We don't know. We actually never find out. <laughs> <laughs> there can't be that many open ones. I assume she could just guess, right? Like if no one's yeah. dead at the moment, it's probably what, I don't know. How high do they go? Double O 12. Who knows? Yeah. The opening of this scene at MI6 is again, I really like this bit. It's just funny and fun as Bond is in, in, in M's office and Nomi, Money, Penny, and Q walk into M's office and Q is like a oh, Bond. Well, uh, it's long time no see. It's been a long time. You know, it's great to see you alive and well. And M is just like, shut up, Q. I know he's staying with you. <laughs> it's on your couch. <laughs> Come on. Money Penny tries to warn him, right? She's like, Bond is in there. And so Q has just a moment to be like, right. right yeah. oh, oh, whoa, it was a surprise. Uh, it's very good. Also, Nomi's outfit in this scene, the pants and the, the orange jacket with the scarf collar thing mm. going on absolutely slays it's very good it's very very good we find out that at the funeral of one of the specter agents they infected the dead body because people came up and kissed the body it was an open casket they came up and like kissed it that any any family members who did that are also now dead of the same thing and they're like ah oh, it's the genetics the realization that m has here is like he crafted this like the whole reason he crafted this weapon was so that they could target single individuals individuals with this dna targeted weapon and the whole plan was yeah. so that they like had super efficient super precise never made a mistake no collateral damage it only kills the person it's programmed to kill and it was only ever supposed to kill individuals and obrachev has modified it to be capable of targeting populations based yeah. on genetic traits and so this is where m turns and realizes like oh god this is much much worse than it was ever supposed to have been yeah so he puts the two double o's on the case you You'd think, I mean, this I, this has probably come up in other situations as well, but you'd think like other double O's would be involved. <laughs> Maybe put every double O on it. I guess he wants to keep it in the family of people that are already in the know. I suppose. Yeah, we've never gone on it before, but I suppose there are other situations where it would have been prudent to get more than just the one agent on it. But anyway, so Bond wishes... 007, good luck. And he gives her the tip to track down Logan Ash, former State Department. You find him and you'll find Obrachev. And Bond is tracking down whoever has the Heracles. By going to Blofeld first. He's yes. been granted access to Blofeld. We see Swan putting on the perfume. She feels very conflicted about it, but that's what she's doing. We see Q taking apart Blofeld's eye. I think this is the one that Blofeld had in him, but he's like looking at like previous media stored on it and stuff, which is mm -hmm. kind of funny. It's like, oh, look at the yeah, internal storage. And, and, of and this you eye. were right that Cyclops did get a new eye after the prologue. Mm, yeah, because he picked up the one from Cuba as well. Yeah. Popped it back yeah, inside. Yeah. So there's a tense moment where Bond and Swan are seeing each other for the first time in five years before they go in to talk to Blofeld. And so the tension in this scene is that what they've made clear is these nanobots can never be removed and are transmissible by touch. Yes. And so we know that Swan has them on her person. This is ludicrous, but this is one of those things you just have to buy into. So it's like the whole scene you're waiting to be like, if Bond touches her, then he will also have this on him. And th if either of them touch Blofeld, he'll just die. And so there's this extended sequence of Blofeld in a little cage. <laughs> being brought it's out very silly it's yeah it's it's very like silence of the lambs or uh actually i think like magneto in x-men is probably a better yeah a better thing swan's like actually you know what i can't do this she's like i don't actually want to be party to this bond tries to grab her on the way out touches her wrist and she's like uh and recoils and leaves the room and now we know that if bond touches blofeld then blofeld's gonna die right except bond got sprayed down with the specter killing nanobots 
Okay, I'm glad you thought of that too, because I realized that on my rewatch, and I was like, wait a minute. So what that means is, for whatever reason, when Obrachev was putting that other cocktail together, he excluded Blofeld specifically. Except that we know he didn't, because they look at the DNA profile of the Spectre-killing nanobots, and it lists Blofeld as not deceased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there's I, no reason like for all intents and purposes if bond touches blofeld he should just kill him already yeah see i wasn't sure if q was looking at a list of the ones Obrachev used or just a list of everyone labeled as specter it, like it was the same formatting yeah. as like all of the other like yeah. dna profiles that they were looking at it was in the same scene anyway i'm glad you also thought of that yeah, there, there's no reason why Bond shouldn't already be lethal to yeah. Blofeld at this point. It's except for creating tension in the scene. Yeah. It's just a nitpicky thing, but this is not Madeline's fault. Bond no. would have done this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I don't know that that's what the movie wants to present to us. No. No. What does Blofeld actually end up revealing over the course of this scene? Apart from the fact that Christoph Waltz is indeed in the movie, which he repeatedly said he was not going to be in the movie, but then it leaked because someone spotted him at Pinewood Studios and then they started including him in the marketing. Uh, so basically all he reveals in this scene is that the key to everything is Madeline. Yeah. He says you have to look to her for your answers and Bond says, no, no, I, you're lying. She didn't, like, I don't believe that she did this. And he's like, oh, no, 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 you're right. She didn't set you up to get blown up at Vesper's grave. That was me. I definitely did that. No, no, she's completely innocent of that, but she's the key. She'll give you all, all the answers. Yeah. And when her secret gets out it will be your undoing is yeah. the, like the big line that was featured in the trailers is like her secret will be the end of you is her secret that she has a kid is that the secret yes. that he's talking absolutely. about absolutely 100 huh. percent. okay that's the secret that's the thing that she's been keeping from bond this whole time she has the answers in that she has a history with Safin, but it makes no sense for that to have been the secret yeah right like there's nothing for her to keep from bond in that regard it's like bond already knows that somebody came to her house to kill her when she was a child she didn't do anything wrong there's nothing to be ashamed of or want to keep secret there's no emotional turning point the audience already knows this the audience has been directed to it as the like this is the thing from her past that is going to open all the doors but it's not right like there's no narrative con like other than the fact that she and Safin have a history and so she can be like well I guess this Safin guy showed back up earlier this week and is probably seems to be doing sinister things and seems involved in some way but that's not like that's not what Blofeld is alluding to right Blofeld knows that she's got a kid that is the thing that Bond doesn't know about Madeline that will be of huge dramatic, like emotional and narrative consequence to Bond in this film. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the like, that's her secret. But he's just like, he's literally just doing couples counseling as he makes a joke here. He's like, just go talk to Madeline. <laughs> get on the same page about everything that's going on and you'll like you'll start to make progress on this in the middle of the scene we get a cutaway to q analyzing the eye and he's now discovered that primo met with logan ash and so we have a potential lead on where ash is because we saw a recording of that from the eye back to the scene with blofeld again and Blofeld basically is like, just doubles down on what he talked about a bit in Spectre, which is like, I just really wanted to hurt you because I wanted to take away all the things that you like because you took away all the things that I like. Remember that? That was the whole thing of the last movie. And then Bond um, snaps and I don't love it. But he 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 just sort of goes, die. And Blofeld's like, what? what? And then he grabs Blofeld's neck and is like, he says, and I quote, die, brother. <laughs> Sounds like it's from a different movie. It does, doesn't it? It's fine. I, I think it's fine in the context of he's not actually trying to kill him and he's trying to menace him. And he does, like, not kill him, right? Like, his he does back away and, like, not kill him because he's, like, going to choke him out. And then he thinks better of it and stops and then Blofeld dies anyway because of the nanobots. But yeah, I don't I don't love it. I don't love most of this scene. <laughs> Yeah, it's just I don't know. I I don't like Spectre very much. So I like I don't have a particular affection for bringing Blofeld back in this context. It's a shame because I love Christoph Waltz very much. Yeah, Christoph Waltz is really good. But this is instance two of them breaking a toy in the toy box. Mm. Right. We've killed Felix off. 
already. It's like, all right, well, we've killed Felix. And it's like, okay, well, now we literally just got Blofeld back last movie. And he got one sort of half-baked plot out of him. And now we're killing Blofeld. Blofeld's dead. And it is not going to be the last toy they break in this film. And it's, okay, it's just going to be a greatest hits of murdering all of Bond's pals. <laughs> like... Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's being done to purpose. It's just killing things because they're not going to use them in the next film. It does feel that way, yeah. Really kind of setting themselves up for failure here, I feel, because it's like, well, what are you going to do next movie? Yeah. And I like, I mean, next movie, they're going to reset, right? They're going to do the exact thing that I don't want them to do, which is reboot everything. I really want them to keep Mallory and Money Penny and Q. Me too. Like, I really want that kind of continuity i think it would be hugely beneficial but i am petrified that they won't yeah i like i've said a few times that my ideal for the next bond movie is to cast 28 to 32 year old actor in the part but keep ray fines and naomi harris and lashana lynch and then set the next movie in 1962 yeah exactly the way they did with all the previous movies maintain all the supporting cast but make a clear break in narrative continuity by setting the movie making it a period movie going back to the origins of the james bond franchise and just like have him be a young agent but not a new double o and just do a bond movie <laughs> with mm -hmm. all those characters and all those actors take your fresh start that way rather than just okay we're gonna recast everybody we're going to formally officially reboot the franchise that's where i think the mistake will be made <laughs> Yeah, I think that's probably going to be the case, too. And I really, really hope we're wrong. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, they should keep they should keep Ray Fiennes and, and Naomi Harris and, and Lashana Lynch if they have a role for her, right? Yeah, and Ben Wyshaw. Oh, and, and Ben Wyshaw, that's right. They, they really should keep those four actors in the fold, whatever else they do. But it should be clearly like, do the next movie with Blofeld right cast a new blofeld redo the story of blow like but have him be the leader of like global terrorist organization specter in the next film and like actually do like silly specter stories <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> of spycraft of competing good versus evil spy organizations or something right like get off this idea that every movie has to be directly narratively continue to contiguous with one another and just like start playing in the sandbox with all the toys you have available and just you know unbreak the ones that you broke in this movie <laughs> yeah oh I, that sounds great they don't i mean so <laughs> bond does not end up actually strangling Blofeld to death as Tanner breaks in and breaks Bond off but then they turn around and realize that he is still dead though because of the nanomachines which in the next scene they determine they're like oh look you're just riddled with nanomachines well you're never getting rid of those and so Bond's like okay I think I figured out what I need to do next cut to Norway and Bond is walking through some woods they're not snowy this time but they're the same woods from the pre-title and then he ends up at the same house from the pre-title and he has a gun drawn madeline swan is there and she's like is that for me and he's like oh uh, uh, no sorry puts the gun away and then we have big emotional scene with bond and madeline swan i don't know how he knew that this was here i guess he would have told him about it this house yeah which implies to me that she told him about saffin <laughs> but I hey guess. Who knows? Yeah, my family home up in Norway. This is this is where my mother died when a guy with a gun came. Like he should know. <laughs> and is she here? Was she commuting? Like, does she have? Is that a day job that she has in London doing psychology for Blofeld? And she like who watches this kid while she's out of town? <laughs> she just flies into to London every morning. <laughs> Brief aside about a different franchise, this was my problem with the first part of the latest Fast and Furious movie, is that Dom and Letty <laughs> have that kid, and it's like, all right, I've decided I am going to take off and join you, and I'm like hold the f up you live off the grid in the middle of nowhere who's watching your five-year-old it's uh it's what's his name well later the dead guy later <laughs> later in the movie like halfway through the movie jordana brewster's character is like oh i took our kids and your kid to paul walker's character so he's gonna he's gonna look after them off camera where we never have to acknowledge the fact that paul walker is deceased yeah but at the beginning of the movie i'm like hold the fuck up dom just left his kid at home <laughs> <laughs> do none of these people have children what the hell i mean com compared with how they treated that kid at the end of fast and furious 8 leaving him home alone as a five-year-old is far from the worst thing that child's been through fair 
<laughs> it feels like the people who wrote this movie have never actually had to deal with childcare. I don't know. <laughs> I'm talking about Fast and the Furious. This is better, but I'm still like, hey, wait a minute. Anyway. I assume they've gone here. My assumption is that like she's worried that she's failed Safin, and so she like took off to get away and put distance yeah. between her and Blofeld. That makes and sense. Brought her kid here. But if she's worried about Safin coming after her, maybe going to this particular house isn't the greatest idea. <laughs> no kidding. Bond regrets. He says, for what felt like five minutes, I wanted to have everything with you. I wanted to give up all of that and be with you. And I don't regret any single thing in my entire life that led me to you, except for when I put you on that train five years ago. And then they go to embrace. And then suddenly there's a child at the top of the stairs. And I mean, she's sort of evasive even still about like what what her secret is yeah, or whatever. But then the kid appears. And I guess I guess that was the secret. I actually never... I never actually realized that that's probably what the what she's being so coy about. Anyway, the the child is Mathilde and is expertly cast. Yeah, which I guess is Matilda. By the way, Matilde yeah. is the name of the actress who played Madeline's mother in the pre-title. Oh, interesting. Just kind of amusing. Mathilde Bourbon. Huh. So they get little Matilda. I'm going to anglicize it just so I don't have to yeah. keep stumbling over the pronunciation. Back into bed. Bond is just sort of staring agog at this and Swan <laughs> says, it's, she's not yours, by the way. And Bond's like, uh, wait, wait, well, hold on. Like, he like, he like snaps out of it. He's like, wait, what, re really? But it's just the eyes, like he's got, got my, nope, not yours. It's like, I know how to do math. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. I'm watching the movie back on my second screen. I forgot about the slinky. Yeah. <laughs> The slinky is so good. It just is like this long, drawn out spring rolling down the stairs as everybody just sits there and like takes in the moment. It's 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 hilarious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back in London, M is sitting in, I don't know, the Hall of M's. It's weird. <laughs> There's like a big <laughs> painting on the wall of Judy Dench. And then when it cuts back to we don't see bernard lee anywhere but i assume that the other angle has has bernard lee because when we cut back to m's side we see robert brown who played m in octopussy through license to kill right i just assume that there's a bernard lee painting around there somewhere <laughs> oh speaking of paintings so you know we've talked before about the painting in m's office Yes. And they were like, they've been like famous naval battles and stuff. So the painting in M's office in this movie, the big one that generally faces camera, not the one behind the desk, but the one mm -hmm. in the middle of the other wall is called The Battle of Germany. It's from 1944. And it was by, I'm just reading here from the article, a British war artist and surrealist painter, Paul Nash. It's an abstract oil painting on canvas with a World War II theme that hangs in the Imperial War Museum in London. According to Architectural Digest, it was selected to hang on M's wall as it hints at some of his emotional conflicts throughout the film. Interesting. Yeah. I just like that they're always using the painting on M's wall to like say stuff about the character. Interesting. I think the painting from... Skyfall. Skyfall? The painting that we talked about previously is hanging in the Hall of M's now. Because mm -hmm. there is a, a painting of a warship on the left wall in that first shot, the one that you can see yeah. Judy Dench in. Mm -hmm. In that scene, M's on the phone with Nomi 007, and she's on the trail of Logan Ash and mentions that Bond gave her the lead, and he's like, cool, nice that you're working together. So that's just sort of an update on what's going on over there. Swan takes Bond to the safe room in the house, which still has all the stuff in it. And she's like, look, here's here's who the Safin guy was. He was part of this family. My dad killed them all with dioxin. He didn't die for some reason. His family provided poison for assassins. They had an island that they called the Poison Garden. I believe the timeline is after that hit on the whole family that Safin survived, Spectre took over the island, but now that Spectre's all dead, Safin has retaken the island and is growing more poisons, I guess. Yes, that sounds about right. It's weird because like they make a big deal about all these amazing poisons that he's growing and it's like, hey, but he doesn't need any of those because he has these effing nanomachines. <laughs> yep. Like, who, so, none of that's important. So I'm going to dig into this movie a little bit now. Uh, go for it. This is just Moonraker. No. 
This movie is just a stealth remake of Moonraker, like the actual bad guy plot, where we've got a guy creating a biological weapon that he can deploy on the world to wipe out whole populations of people to create a better future for the world. My problem with this movie, and it will become a bigger and bigger and bigger problem as the movie goes on, because the movie is not really interested in it. What the movie is actually about here, the actual antagonist is the weapon, right? Safin is not an entity in this movie. <laughs> he's just the guy holding the weapon. Well, he's no Michael Lonsdale. We don't ever learn what his motivations are. We don't ever learn what he's trying to achieve. We don't ever learn who he intends to kill. We don't ever learn anything about what his plan is. All we know is that he's making this weapon to distribute and use and that he can't be allowed to continue to have it. So in that way, he's much more boring than what's his name than droopy oh, dog no. from yeah <laughs> because because we have no motivation for him whatsoever he he makes overtures it's like well i i too want to make the world a better place i just want to be a little bit tidier but there's no how like yes in and of itself committing genocide is bad i get it but we don't have any of his motive. Why? Why does he want to do this? <laughs> like, what is his what is he trying to achieve? And why? I cannot believe that they never lay it out in the movie that like what his actual end goal was, because in Moonraker, like he was a space Nazi, right? I get it. He's a space Nazi. He wants to create the world of supermen. I want to repopulate the Earth with my Aryan super soldiers. That's, there you go, right? That's a Bond plot. That's a good, like, it's a good plot. You've actually messed me up because I, yeah, that's a really good point. At no point does Safin actually talk about why he wants to do this. Yeah, it never comes up. Huh. And so, as I say, like, to an extent, I get it, because what the movie cares about is that this super weapon shouldn't exist and can't be in anyone's hands. But, yeah, it messes me up that there's, like, there's no motivation for the primary villain of the movie. He's just doing his thing because. Because he's mad, I guess. Yeah. But we don't know at whom or what or why. He didn't like Spectre, but they're already dead. And he was only mad at Madeline's dad because her dad killed his whole family, but... He's dead and her mom is dead and he's kind of weirdly in love with her. Yep. Which super inappropriate, by the way, Safin. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You've really, I've actually did not clue into that. And that's a really good point. <laughs> so that bugs me. Yeah. I feel like there was something else I wanted to dig on the movie a bit here. And I've like derailed myself completely by going in on on this being Moonraker. Again. Oh, is it Bond's staunch refusal only for narrative purposes to tell MI6 where he is? No, that wasn't okay. it. It was another more Broad. general okay. criticism of the film. I'm sure it'll come to me. The next time we see something that jogs my memory, I'm sure it'll come to me. So Bond does indeed phone into MI6 and give them all this information, but not where he actually is. They wake up the next morning and Matilda wakes Bond up and then he makes, it looks like crepes. And she says they're not bad. There's one nice morning of being a normal family. They all wake up, dad makes crepes and they hang out and have a nice time. They get like three hours maybe of being yeah. a normal family. Nice for Bond. He gets a phone call. They figured out where the island is, it's an old, it's actually, it was very similar geographically to, I don't remember the character's name, the bad guy from Skyfall. Yes, I know the one you're talking about. Anyway, geographically sort of, you know, abandoned island in between Japan and Russia. And they look at some recent satellite images and they are stocking up with ships and stuff. Like there's, there's a lot of activity and they're like, okay, well, if that's where Safin is and that's where Heracles is. So that's where we need to go. So we're going to send Bond, we're going to send you and 007, and you're both going to go in there and figure it out. Bond says, okay, cool, uh, I need an airplane. And they're like, to where? And he's like, I'm not going to tell you yet, but hey, where is 007? And they're like, oh, she's trailing Logan Ash. Here's where she is on a map. And Bond's like, no, no, I asked you to show me. He, she's tracking Logan Ash, not me. Uh-oh. When he realizes uh -oh. that Logan Ash is coming for him. And that's why it's the same area in Norway on the map. So he's like, oh, okay, we got to go. So they bundle into the Land Rover, who have been a vehicle sponsor of the Bond films since Octopussy. Oh, yeah. Like consistently. Yeah. Because remember, Aston Martin went off for a bit and we got the bad right. BMW phase. But yeah, because there's always, you know, it's, it's 
It's like, look, Aston Martin is Bond's car, but not everybody in the world can drive an Aston Martin. So we need more than one vehicle sponsor. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to pile the family into a Toyota SUV. So they barrel off down this amazing road. What is this road? The name is the, I'm going to ruin this accent, the Atlanter Atlanter Havsvejen. It means Atlantic Ocean Road. Okay. (laughs) It's the Atlantic Ocean Road. It runs through an archipelago connecting a bunch of islands to the mainland, and it just looks really cool. Absolutely fabulous scene, though, here, where, like, they're driving away these two black SUVs pass them along the road. Like, Bond looks tense. The SUVs go by and disappear over the crest of a bridge into the distance, and then we get this awesome panning shot of Bond's SUV driving towards us with the bridge in the background. And just as Bond's car comes into the the front of frame, you can see the two SUVs crest the hill of the bridge in the background in pursuit. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that shot is good. (laughs) It's very good. They drive into the woods. They go off road. And then we get a very cool action scene, like a whole big set piece. There's more SUVs and bikes come bursting out of the trees, (laughs) catching a lot of air. Yeah. And uh, then we get a little bit of sort of like Bond as, I don't know, like predator like i don't know what the 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 not actual reference but i don't know what uh how we would describe this but they're like sneaking around in the jungle essentially <laughs> the jungles of yeah. norway the jungles of norway <laughs> i mean that's, that's basically what they're in very good Anyhow, yeah, this again, this whole this whole sequence is great. The chase leading into it is awesome. And then the forest combat. I'm not going to call it a jungle. The forest combat that happens afterwards is so good. And they do this great setup of like they're driving across the plains and towards this forest. And the forest is entirely enshrouded in fog. And as they like he drives into the forest and the whole climate and color and light level of the scene changes as they drive into this fog. And it's this very quiet forest and you can just hear the like roaring of the motorcycles off in the distance as they're like hunting around for him. He like stashes Madeline and Mathilde in a a little hut they find and leaves them with a gun and and, and then goes on the hunt and uses a a winch cable to clothesline a guy and manages to just use positioning and and like baiting the enemies to like charge him with their vehicles to slam into like dead logs and things to flip their cars over awesome 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 action scene i think it's one of the best action scenes in the movie from a like tension and release and just the sort of like character of bond the shooting like this cat and mouse game in the forest is super good mm-hmm. i love it it's I love it's it too. it's fabulous it's a super good sequence it sort of culminates to an extent with him actually finally confronting Logan Ash and he runs out of bullets. Like he takes their car out and Ash is fallen out of it and clearly has broken legs or something. So can't like stand up and is trying to crawl away from the truck that's like teetering on a small rise in the forest being held up by like a tree that is slowly giving way. Ash makes reference to his brother. Yeah, he's like, come on, you know, it's it's all over. Lend me a hand, brother. And Bond says, I had a brother once. His name was Felix and then kicks the SUV and it rolls down the embankment and crushes him. <laughs> <laughs> Grim, but man, like I said, they got a really punchable face. <laughs> He really did. Yeah. Well cast. Back where they're hiding, Swan and Matilda get captured by Safin. Not before Madeline Swan like kills a couple people, but they they do get captured and fly away in a helicopter. <laughs> leaving Bond to and leaving Bond there, leaving Bond to then walk back down the like <laughs> logging road or whatever eventually getting picked up by 007 nice little call back as she pulls up next to him and delivers the wanna ride in the same accent like the jamaican accent that she was using at the beginning of the film when they first right. met yeah that's good they head to the nearest nato base where there is indeed a plane waiting for them and on the plane is q and a whole bunch of gadgets so we get a nice little q scene and a smaller plane <laughs> and, i'm yeah, full and of smaller. tinier planes exactly <laughs> It's diplomatically awkward for M at the moment because there's the Russians and the Japanese and even the Americans are like, what's going on? And they're like, so it's the plan is 
get in, try to save Madeline and, and Matilda if you can, but apart from anything else, stop whatever Safin is doing. And then this is where Nomi is like, I think, by the way, that Bond should have the designation 007 back. I mean, after all, it is just a number. And again, Bond is like, okay, like... <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I Thanks, really I guess. Yeah, I really feel like Bond continues to just like no sell this because he's like, if it makes you feel better, I guess. Yeah, like I, I don't I really don't think Bond gives a shit. Yeah, I, that's another like it's again, that scene just feels really awkward. Yeah. It's like, oh, we got to we got to make sure that he's 007 at the end of the movie. OK, sure. Yeah, I do like the gag and the the cute gadget scene. And he's as he's like putting together the watch and like getting the smart blood together. He's like, you remember the smart blood, right? And it, like he's pulling drawers out of his cabinet and he accidentally pulls out his tea set. And it's like, whoops, yeah. that's the wrong drawer. <laughs> yeah, it's way too organized. It's in tactical foam. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I love it. It's great. So back on the island now, we see that Safin, the swans are there and that Obrachev has prepared for Safin a little vial that I think he, I think he reveals at this at this point is Heracles dialed to Madeline Swan so that yes. if this, you know, that what's in this vial would kill both of them if something happens. So it's like his insurance yes. policy. And he, he calls back specifically to the the hair that he was yeah. playing with when he visited her office. The architecture in here, I love all of this because it's all old Soviet missile installation. So they get to go big brutalist with like cool yeah. vaulted concrete rooms and everything. Do we know why Safin has this Japanese affect he's putting on? No, it never comes up. It's just the thing that he does. He's wearing a kimono and they have like a Zen garden and they're installing tatami mats and stuff for him when they get there. Yeah, no, they there's never any not that I recall any indication as to why. Huh. Anyhow, this this base again reminds me of Moonraker. It's another reason why I'm like, oh, they're doing Moonraker. Big brutalist, but it's all the like the concrete angled walls and the the little idyllic garden in the middle of it. It's just like, OK, we're just doing Moonraker again, except now. Now we're on a, a an abandoned island in the middle of the Pacific instead of instead of like an Aztec ruin in the Brazilian jungle. Uh, <laughs> I guess this is a little more believable. They don't have the yellow outfits. The yellow True. jumpsuits are are truly missing. They have pink jumpsuits. Pink jumpsuits on the the poison workers. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Safin takes Matilda to show her around the poison garden, much to Madeline's distress. And then eventually they just get fully separated. And it's, I don't know, Safin is in love with, he admits as much later, is in love with Madeline and I guess wants to adopt Matilda or like wants to be her father figure, I guess. It's almost like his motivations are really poorly sketched in this film. Well, here's, <laughs> yes. Yes. Also, <laughs> here's something that they've never done before in a Bond movie. Directly involve a child in the last act. In fact, right. I mean, there haven't, haven't been much children in Bond films at all. Do you feel like that sort of changed the tone of the like presumed danger of the last act of this? A little bit. I felt like there was a little bit of like, well... We know they're not going to kill a kid. If they do, it would be really grim for a Bond movie. Yeah. I don't know. It, that, that's a minor thing, but I was definitely like, this feels weird. It does feel like it does feel weird. And it's it's one of those things, again, where like I think a lot of the ideas they have in this movie are good ideas. I, In fact, I think this whole like plot of Bond having a child and having to like reckon with that and step into the father figure role and having that be sort of like a threat, I guess. But to a lesser extent, I actually think the like having him deal with this and sort of come to understand his responsibilities as a father in that regard are like a good idea, right? That's something we've never done in a Bond movie before. I think that's a good thing for them to like if they want to do something different, using that storyline is totally fair game. I think that's good. I just don't know that they've done a very good job executing on it in this movie. <laughs> Yeah. Of all the plots in this movie, I think that one's the one that works best and most completely. Like that's the sort of the 40 minutes of story in this two hour and 40 minute movie that like actually really gel and flow pretty well is the like he has a history with Madeline. They get separated. They come back together. It turns out he's got a kid and then he has to save the world and try and sort of keep his family from being caught in the crossfire. Right. That's a good story that I think functions at a base mechanical level in this movie. <laughs> 
more than most of the rest of the film. Mm, yeah. Bond and 007, or I guess Bond and Nomi at this point. 007 and the other 00, who is now Nomi. <laughs> The doubles 07. The doubles 07 head in that glider, like you said, the, the plane full of smaller planes. It's a submersible glider. So they like glide out of the thing. I mean, it's not just a glider. It also has propulsion. They get underwater. They turn, they, it goes down. They, they retract the wings. It turns into a submarine. <laughs> they come up in the sub bay inside the thing and they infiltrate the base, the poison garden, essentially. Bond has an EMP in his watch, which is fun. Yeah, he uses it to take out all the surveillance cameras. Yeah, they're moving around inside. Very cool shots. Like I said, like great architecture and and set dressing there's this wide shot of yeah a bunch of people in pink hazmat jumpsuits sweeping the water i don't know exactly what it is that they're doing it's deeply unclear how they harvest <laughs> poison her heracles <laughs> They're nanobots, but they have to grow them in vats. But that's just the raw materials that they need in order to actually manufacture the Heracles into a weaponized state. But even weaponized Heracles isn't fatal until it's programmed. But the the water that they're using to culture the Heracles with the people in the hazmat suits is like acidic. And if you fall into it, you die instantly. <laughs> sure. It, it, this is not the most far-fetched a Bond movie's ever been, but it doesn't make a ton of sense. It looks really cool. It does look really cool. I'm down with that. It doesn't need to make perfect sense. I literally, my only complaint is that I don't understand the motivation. I'm like, I'm on board for all of the goofy nonsense. That's all fine. I just wish I understood what Zaffin was threatening. Yeah. The 007 take over the area where all the scientists are, uh, where, of course, Obrachev is there as well. Just dug in like a tick, this guy. <laughs> Bond leaves Nomi there with a bunch of explosives and is like, all right, well, if I don't come back, you blow this whole place to hell and I'm going to go and try to find Safin and see what's going on upstairs. Meanwhile, Primo is left alone with Madeline and giving her some tea. And I don't know if this tea is actually poisoned. It's like implied that it is, but I don't know why it would be. And it doesn't seem to be like Madeline is like, you know what this flower does? It makes you blind if you get even a drop in your eye. And then she throws some at Primo, who shows up again later and is not blind in his good eye. I don't think. And like, I, 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 I think question. he just I think he just recoils in this scene because it's hot tea. <laughs> Yeah, the clear implication to me is that in the previous scene where she got separated from Safin, Safin is showing a flower to Mathilde, and he says, this flower makes you do what you're told. It makes you behave. And then the tea that we see is tea made with two flowers from that plant. Oh, wow, I did not put that together. That's a good point. And Madeline knows this because she also has background in herbology, because that's been a recurring theme throughout the movie. So she's looking at it, she knows what this is and i mean i take it to be that what she's saying is true is like if you get any of this in your eye it's, it blinds you who knows because you're right cyclops comes back in a later scene and does apparently have vision so i guess it didn't although i would think that you know first second degree burns to the eyeball would probably you know blind you <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So maybe the tea wasn't very hot. Who knows? The clear implication of this scene is he's trying to make Madeline compliant by poisoning her with the flower that makes you compliant. Okay, I hadn't put that together, but that, that actually makes a lot of sense. That's something I should have put together. It doesn't work because she throws it in Primo's face and escapes the room and like locks and him in the room. And escapes immediately, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, because she's very capable and I like that. So now Bond is approaching Safin. So they're in this big, vaulted, brutalist room. There's dudes with guns. There's three three dudes with guns. And there's Safin sitting on a tatami mat in the middle of the room with Matilda and her little toy rabbit named Dudu. And he gets Bond to put down his big gun and then also put down his smaller gun, but not before demonstrating how dead he will be by picking up a pillow and throwing it up into the air and having all the guards just immolate it with bullets which seems supremely dangerous <laughs> in a room like this yeah they're on opposite sides of the room if nothing else would be so loud <laughs> <laughs> yeah a giant concrete room with walls angled downwards towards the center of the room where they are seated <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's just fire bullets into those walls surely ricochets won't be a concern yeah 
So here's where we get Safin's big villain monologue, which, as I mentioned, his thing is basically like, look, we're the same, we're the same sort of person, right? We both hate Spectre, right? Like Spectre did us dirty. You know, we got screwed over by Mr. White, by Blofeld. We both fell in love with Madeline. We both just want the world to be a better place. We just, we're just doing, we're going about it in different ways, right? And it's like, yeah, oh, okay, I guess, sure. You know, like speaking from Bond's perspective, right? It's like, okay, I, yeah, I, I, I see where you think you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I honestly, I quite like this. I like Rami Malik. We haven't talked much about him. I think he's doing a good job here. I, in contrast to all the great cinematography in this movie so far, this conversation is shot very flat. It's just a bunch of ones, yeah. just like normal back and forth conversational clean over the shoulder shots. And I, I wish it was a little bit more involved visually but apart from that i think this is fine yeah i give like 80 percent odds that in the the close shots the guys standing the guards standing in the background are mannequins <laughs> just dressed up in outfits <laughs> like they're 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 in deep bouquet so you can't really ah oh, they're moving slightly but it, like can you imagine being that extra <sighs> we're gonna just have you stand here for an hour <laughs> you're never gonna be visible you're just gonna be completely blurred out in the background but you're just gonna mm -hmm. stand here but yeah, I like Rami Malek in this movie. He does a good job of like selling the menace, even though he's really boring. Like He's, he's menacing, but he's got no panache really mm. at all. There's very little theatricality. Like he's just very flat. And again, I think the menace is there. I think he comes across as like when he's threatening Madeline. I, I think he like does a really good job of being menacing and like appearing threatening. But I like he's just he's just so flat. <laughs> They've given him all these affectations, but we just know nothing about his character at all. He's just such a non-entity in the film that it, I'm impressed that Rami Malek was able to do as much with the character as he did. I think that's a fair assessment, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah. After this conversation, Bond starts to grovel, essentially. He's like, OK, you're right. You're right. I got it. I'm sorry. I, I beg of you, you know, forgive me. You are right. Because the, the deal that Safin is making him is like, look, you leave my baby alone and I'll leave your baby alone. This is where he tells Bond, this is your kid, by the way. But he doesn't yeah. do it directly. He just is like, he gestures to Matilda and is like, look, you leave my baby alone, that being Heracles and his plan to just kill a bunch of people and I'll leave your baby alone, right? So just leave, take your explosives, shut them down, leave the island. I won't kill uh, her or Matilda. And Bond's like, okay, well, I'll take them, I'll take them both with me then. And Safin is like, mm, you can take the kid, but Madeline's staying with me. And Bond's like, no, I don't think that's going to work. And then it's like, well, then I'll kill them both. And the Bond's like, okay, okay, okay. Grovels and manages to find another gun somewhere in his groin, I think. It was some sort of secret gun. It's unclear where he had that hidden. Yeah, he yeah. kind of hammer spaces it. You would think that they would have searched him. <laughs> Yeah, I guess they show that they didn't. He takes his his AR off at like he unstraps and is like, I'm unarmed. But nobody searched him. Yep, they just that's left true. Him full of tinier guns. <laughs> <laughs> he uses the guns to take out the, the three people in the room, but there's a trap door. And so Safin escapes with Matilda down through a trap door. Just in time for Madeline to walk into the room. Yeah, just in time. I forgot to mention that when the 007 went into that room with all the scientists, that's where they found out they were looking at a computer model of what is intended. And this is where we find out that Safin's just going to kill huge swaths of people in the world. Again, yeah. we don't know why, but he's going to just kill lots of people because he likes it to be tidy. He's going to kill billions for some reason. Yeah. As they're making to leave the island, Matilda's not playing nice and Safin's like, all right, well, if you don't want my protection, then you can just go off by yourself. And Matilda's like, cool, and leaves and <laughs> just runs away from him. And he's like, you know, okay, fine, goodbye. He just doesn't really care. So Matilda just wanders off by herself. Yeah, that's a bit weird. It is weird. Nomi is now taking Obrachev as sort of like a human shield and leaves all the other scientists to run away because she's, you know, mined that whole place. And so now it's going to become more and more obvious that they're there because before they were still keeping like kind of on the DL a little bit, at least her involvement. Mm -hmm. They're sneaking around. A guard spots them. She shoots the guard and he falls into the pool and then starts like, you know, basically melting. And that's where all the scientists in the pool are like, oh, crap. Oh, crap. we got to get out of here. Obrachev is begging for his life in a weird way. He's begging for his life by saying, by the way, I could kill uh, your yeah. whole race. <laughs> he begs for his life by just getting super racist. Yeah. Just like super racist. <laughs> He's like, he's like, I have a strain that would take out the entire West African diaspora. Wouldn't that be neat? And she's like, okay, wh what the, 
<laughs> what the hell? You're not helping your case. Yeah. Then she gets to kind of say the name of the movie. She's like, hey, doctor, guess what time it is? It's time to die. And just like Sparta kicks him into the fluid. So he melts. Good death for him. Yeah. Deserved. So Bond and Madeline catch back up together. They're walking around. They stumble across Matilda, who hid quote, just like she was told. And so they get reunited, which is great. Bond basically bundles the three of them into the lifeboat and they head off away from the island. Bond is calling in an airstrike, basically. And they're like, we can't, I don't think we can do that. And Bond's like, you'd better do it. You know, like it's again, it's diplomatically challenging. Yeah. If we just fire nine missiles at an island between Russia and Japan, everybody's going to lose their mind. Yeah. Russia and <laughs> Japan and World Police America are also nearby and are like, what do you do in England? Yeah. What do, like, do you what? want to start World War Three? And Bond is like, if we don't, there won't be a world to go to war. <laughs> Yeah, but before that's going to work, because of course this is a missile silo, he's got to open up the missile doors or else the missiles won't penetrate through to where all the poison and stuff is. Oh, this is where we get the other scene. So there's a bit where we follow Bond up some stairs towards the big room of lights and poison fluid. And he's up on a catwalk near the camera and he runs off and then immediately runs on again way further away than he would have had time to actually like clear that distance. Oh, yeah. So this is the other instance of Bond being sort of like temporally anomalous. James Bond, the SCP. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it, it, I kind of like it, right? Like, I think it's a neat, yeah. a neat technique. Then we get that scene that you mentioned of Bond in the circular hallway. In the circular room, hallway, yeah. Which is like, it's cool, I guess. It's, I guess you're just throwing that in there because it's a neat visual that you can use in the trailers. Yeah, it, I mean, it is great. And it, it really does, like, call back to the gun barrel scene. Like, it's visually, like, just a really well-constructed shot that I like a lot. He steps into a, the bottom of a stairwell because he needs to get to the top of this tower to the control room to open the doors. He steps into a stairwell and a incendiary grenade gets thrown down at him. So he, he's like, <laughs> ah, grabs it, hurls it back up. So it blows up further up in the stairwell around where it's been thrown from. And then three more <laughs> incendiary grenades get dropped down on him. So he <laughs> dives to the side and somehow doesn't get completely immolated, which is very impressive. Yeah. And then we get a uh, oneer. Yeah, which I almost love. I, I kind of dig it. I'm What's, uh, what's your... Why are you not totally sold on the oneer? The oneer in this case being a long take action scene without edits that continues on in one shot. Yeah, so I, I think this shot is great. It's several minutes long. It goes on forever. It's really impressive. It starts at 2.21.16. Okay. Yeah. It goes to 2.23-ish. Like, you know, it's like a, a minute and a half or so. It's Bond climbing this stairwell, and the camera follows along with him, and it's this this sort of, like, square-shaped stairwell that goes up several floors. And at each floor, there's a door. And so he, like, gets to a level, and guys come through the doors, or he can see the, the shadows of the guys on the next platform up, reflected on the wall and it does this really really impressive job of tension building all the way up and like really impressive stunt work and like gunplay all the way up every landing something happens that's super intense and it just gets more and more and more intense the higher up he gets it concludes when he gets to the door to the control room and Cyclops busts through and they get into a grappling fight and he throws Cyclops down the stairs to the landing below and they like they both tumble down and the camera cuts there and I really truly wish they had continued the long shot through Bond killing Cyclops because it's almost subconscious but the camera cutting away in that moment releases a bunch of tension from the scene mm. but the actual scene hasn't hit its tension release yet and so the camera flinches on the scene basically and doesn't hold through the actual release of tension in the, the scene. I just, that cut frustrates me to no end. And it's because they've dropped down a landing. And so the camera cuts from the landing. It's on to the landing below in close up with Bond grappling with Cyclops. But it's, I don't want to say easy, but we've literally in the last year had a movie where the, the entire movie was shot in to look like a single shot. And right. it's just like, I wish they had blocked that differently mm -hmm. so that they could have maintained the long shot through Cyclops. Cyclops's death and then watched Bond walk out of the stairwell 
and then cut away because after he like he kills he kills cyclops he delivers a quip to q who's like oh i had to show someone your watch i really blew their mind and then q is like do you know where the control room is and his bond bond like holsters his gun and climbs up the stairwell towards that last door again and says well my russian's a little rusty but i think so and then walks out of shot and if they had just held (laughs) held the scene through the entry to the exit Mm. of that action sequence i think it would have been way stronger it would have like helped with the thrust of that scene a lot more i just it all i can see is the cut in this scene now and it frustrates me to no end so again this is like a super nitpicky aesthetic thing but it undermines the whole point of doing it as a one -er (laughs) to me (laughs) yeah i can't i can't disagree with that I, I think that that that's a really good point. You can see just before they tumble down the stairs that there's a hidden cut mm-hmm. where because most of this is Daniel Craig going up the stairs. But right. this hidden cut where Primo bumps into the camera basically would be to cut to their stunt doubles for <laughs> jumping <Yeah. laughs> down an entire flight of stairs. So it would be a difficult cut. You'd have to basically have the camera then rush down the stairs after them and then do basically the same kind of cut with one of them ob- totally obscuring the frame back yeah. to the actual actor. If you actors. were to maintain the same blocking. Yeah. Right? Like, that's why I say I just wish they had blocked it differently so that Altered it, the blocking, yeah. yeah. No, I think that's fair. I do very much like that Bond activates the localized range EMP on his watch to blow up the eye prosthetic <laughs> inside it's Primo's really good. head. That's that's how he dies. It looks cool. It's thematically appropriate. And then, yeah, the line about Q, I had to show someone your watch, it blew their mind. Very good. Nice to get that. There's even a little like, gling. there's like a little tiny <laughs> little James Bond music sting after that line, which I appreciate. Yeah. Bond, as he holsters his gun and turns out of shot, has this swagger to his step this like exhausted swagger to his step which is really great daniel craig does a fantastic job of that that physicality there but yeah i super appreciate what you're saying about the one or i think that's a really excellent point q tries to walk him through the correct way to do the controls he just sort of flips (laughs) a bunch of buttons and it all works which is nice he's let the counterweights go and opened the silo doors so that the missiles will be able to come through the missiles are away and now m is having to field a whole bunch of calls from international <laughs> international intelligence agencies on his way back out bond finds matilda's little doo-doo bunny and so he grabs that and then on his way out he notices that the bomb doors have closed again and he's not sure why so he's got to go back he's rushing back to the thing because the the missiles are on the way now and they're going to be there in nine minutes from launch and so he's got to get back and reopen the doors again and on his way rushing back he gets shot in the leg by Safin who of course hasn't escaped the island yet and so they're now uh, in one of those little sort of like round pools in the middle of the zen garden that they've built in the sort of silo area yeah they, we have our one-on-one villain fight yeah which is pretty quick honestly it is it's quick there's like some of it is pretty grim <laughs> <laughs> yeah bond takes a couple of bullet wounds right like he gets shot in his leg which causes him to fall over then he gets shot again in like the back and so you start to see his shoulder saturate with blood then they get into a hand-to-hand fight pond fully breaks Safin's arm over his knee yep which is pretty rough and in the course of the fight Safin rakes his hand across bond's cheek and once the the threat is dealt with he's broken Safin's arm bond sort of recoils and Safin tells him you know our tragedy is complete i've taken from you the thing you love you you'll never be able to touch them again and reveals that the vial that he had made of the heracles targeting madeline and matilde has been broke like he's broken it in his hand and has now poisoned bond with this targeted heracles preventing him from from being able to have contact with them again so bond sort of realizes what what's going on here stands up and just puts three bullets in saffin <laughs> yeah this is the point because they've done such they've made such a point up until now about how it's uncurable it is not removable once you have it you are never getting rid of it and so this is the point in the movie where i was like are they gonna do what i think they're gonna do yeah i still didn't think they'd do it but they but they, but they did they, they did it so <laughs> bond just shoots saffin a whole bunch and then runs back to the to the room i guess it's implied that safin closed the doors i guess yeah. anyway he reopens the the doors so they're all open and they're going to be fine the the missiles will do their job and he gets on with q again and he's like so just to clarify you, this definitely is never going to get removed and q is like nope nope not at all 
And then Q realizes, oh God, you've been poisoned with it, haven't you? And he's like, yep. Can you put Madeline on? And so he gets on the phone with Madeline and is like, I'm not going to be coming back now. And then it makes it clear that it's because he's infected with it and he can, he'll never be able to see them again anyway, even if he did get out. He's basically, he's uh, happy that Matilda exists. She confirms to him that Matilda is his daughter. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He actually gets full confirmation of that from her. And then there's a sweeping wide shot where he looks very much like Nathan Drake. I think it's the suspenders. <laughs> and the Henley. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then... Uh, yeah, then the missiles fly in and like split into a bunch of smaller missiles and slam to the ground, at which point James Bond 007 is immolated by m missiles. Yeah, he's pretty definitively dead. And dies. It's a nice shot. It's a great shot. They do a really good job of the wide shot of the island with the missiles raining down on it and just like everything blowing up. Yeah. It's a really beautiful shot. And he reminds Madeline that they've got all the time in the world that Madeline and Matilda have all the time in the world. Uh, and yeah, then they kill James Bond. James Bond dies. And so there's another toy in the toy box. They broke. That was weird. It was weird for James Bond to die. But again, this is what I'm saying. This is like, because of how they set up these movies, because of what they decided they wanted to do with these movies, making this an arc of Daniel Craig's time as Bond, this was a great ending to that. I think that this was a, f a good final chapter in that arc. I don't like the arc. I don't think it should have <laughs> happened. I don't think that the arc needed to exist or was told particularly well as a whole, but I think this was a good ending to what they had created. Yeah, and I see where you're coming from. I think my position differs slightly. Not a, not a lot. Like, I don't think there's a lot of distance between where you and I land, which is like, this does feel like a good ending for an arc involving James Bond. But I don't think there was an arc, and I don't think they earned it. And you really only get to kill James Bond once. <laughs> yeah, you can't just keep they, they can't they can't keep doing this. This feels like a waste of that idea. If they had come into this with a plan for like, we're going to do five movies and we're going to make an arc of it. And we're like, we're actually going to build up the James Bond character and then we're going to tear him down. But we're going to like build up the mythos of James Bond in the process. Like we're going to we're going to have a story that is told contiguously across these five movies. And this is our plan for it. I think this would have been a good ending for it. But I think I think what this movie does for me is it throws into really crystal clarity just how bad an idea trying to retrofit an arc onto this franchise was yep. and it exposes all of the weaknesses of the previous the previous three films because i still think casino royale is basically as close to perfect as a bond movie could be but I, I just feel like ending this stretch of five movies on this note makes it apparent how weak that construction of five movies was and how poorly they were able to piece together a, a meaningful arc and lay the groundwork for trying to tell this story. And so this movie really suffers for me because it is like this is the kind of story you tell when you bring your fabled hero out of retirement to do one last job and he has to heroically sacrifice himself to ensure that the world lives on and that the next generation of his family lives on that's a good story to finish that on but they didn't do that they brought him out of retirement three previous times and he never had an arc and he never really had a friendship with felix in these movies it's all just referenced because he didn't felix didn't appear on screen in the last two movies so they only really had like one and a half adventures together and the daniel craig franchise because of the way it's constructed sort of puts forward the idea that these are the only adventures bond had right like they they don't allude to the idea that bond had a bunch of other missions in between the ones that we saw and so there's just there's no history for the character to draw it's it's just doing everything based on borrowed import from its franchise but it's not actually paying that much regard to its franchise it's you know conveniently pulling reference when it feels like it can do so for emotional effect but it's not really honoring the bond franchise in a meaningful way it's only concerned with the five movies that star daniel craig and those movies don't fit together. And so trying to end it like this just weakens the whole endeavor because they've now used this great idea in a severely suboptimal way. 
And so I like it just it doesn't work for me. And I don't think it's a good ending to this arc. Like, I don't think it's a good ending to this arc because I don't think this arc works. But I think it's a good ending to an arc that I can imagine in my head that they might have made. I love that you and I are coming at it from different angles. (laughs) We agree on the image macro of the clasped hands from Predator. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Where it's like, you're on, this would work as the ending to a different arc. I'm on, this is a good ending to this arc. But we we agree (laughs) on this arc was bad. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This shouldn't have happened. Yeah. So I I mostly just find this movie very frustrating as a result. And yet, while I have no idea where I'm going to rank it, like overall still, I have not even begun to think about that. I still put this firmly in the middle of the Craig films. (laughs) Yeah, so do I. Right? It's like Casino Royale, Skyfall, this one specter quantum yeah a hundred percent that i i in fact did think about where i would rank this because i i maintain a ranked list of the bond movies on my letterboxd account right of course and so i did spend some time sort of hemming and hawing over where i would put it and i put it in a tentative place after seeing it and i don't know if that'll change but it did fall in between in, in exactly that position across the daniel craig bond movies and like for what it's worth i think there's a lot of cool stuff in this movie i just wish it hadn't been been so hamstrung by the movies it's trading on i think that's fair i think also that if you don't care and that's a strong word because you shouldn't necessarily have to care but if you don't care about james bond films as much as say two guys who do a podcast about it do you know if you're just sort of in there to enjoy the movie i can see you getting way more out of this because i do yeah. think it's like by and large like well paced and fun and entertaining and i like i said i came out of this having had a much better time in the theater than i did when i came out of specter yes but 100 percent, i agree with you yeah but i also agree with all the stuff you just said we go back by the way because we're not quite done the movie but we go back to mi6 where they've set out a drink for Bond and in M's office are M, Money Penny, Q, and I guess 007. I guess she's 007 again. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. This time they retired the number. Yeah. Now that he's dead, not retired. Yeah. And Tanner is also there. And M reads a poem that is essentially paraphrased. I'm not sure who it's by, but it essentially paraphrases to, you know, the point of life is to live and enjoy it and not spend your time worrying about getting to the living part. And, you know, it's, it's like, I guess, but he did just die. So I guess he's not living now, <laughs> is he? M. Anyway, and then they go, all right, back to work. And then we cut back to Madeline and Matilda driving on the same road as they did in the beginning of the movie in, in an Aston Martin again. And she's like, oh, I'll tell you about your dad one day. We've, we've got all the time in the world. Yeah. I, I'm going to tell you a story of a man named James Bond. And then the camera pans out and they disappear into a tunnel. And then it goes to the end credits where the end credits indeed play All the Time in the World by Louis Armstrong from the soundtrack to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And I had to go to the bathroom so badly. <laughs> you have to wait until the absolute ass end of the credits, like until the like the special thanks, the like, yo, by the way, this was filmed on Panavision film or what? This was filmed mostly on 65 millimeter, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, like this was, you know, the Motion Picture Association and then like the absolute fine print of like, this is owned by Aeon <laughs> Productions, filmed at Pinewood Studios, et cetera, et cetera. You got to wait for all of that. Every last thing. It is dead ass silent. They bring up the title of the movie again. It's you just watched No Time to Die. Fades out. Wait another like solidly like three seconds after even more fine print. And then it says James Bond will return. And I say audibly in the theater, how? <laughs> I love it. I almost wish they hadn't put it there. (laughs) I don't know. Stand your ground. (laughs) Right? Like, you just killed James Bond. Let's leave that an open question until you make the next movie. But on the one hand, I appreciate that it's there because it's like, all right, we intend to continue the James Bond franchise and James Bond, the character, will return in a future adventure. But to a certain extent, I wish they had just like in the same way that I wish like Infinity War hadn't had a post credit sequence. Right. Where it's like, you know, we just they just just, let it sit for once. Thanos snapped and nothing. That would have been powerful. I like it when they break convention for good reason. Mm, Right. I I like playing with the formula. I like introducing novel ideas. I like putting a twist on things. 
if they're gonna do this story and kill james bond i like i would have liked them to like don't reassure us bond's dead you just killed him let us sit with that for a while i appreciate the reassurance <laughs> I agree with you. I think it'd be very cool. I actually much prefer the 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 Infinity War idea, but I do I do think that that it would have been really cool. Like, what a neat idea! But also, I, I'm 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 glad that they're not just like, all right, we're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, I don't know. I I look forward to the next Bond movie. Yeah, me too. This one wasn't a total write off. It was it no. was fun. I would classify it as like categorically a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> which is a shame because we like spun up this whole podcast to like be so ready long. for this movie we spent like two years anticipating this movie i don't know 20 2021 was a rough year for me and media generally mm -hmm. where like everything i was excited for disappointed and it's only recently that i've had like a couple of things like really deliver for me but there was this a video game i played that i've been like super hyped for and just incredibly disastrously let me down a couple other movies that i was like super hyped for that didn't turn out and so it's so like just let me enjoy something <laughs> please just let me enjoy something <laughs> and eon productions will whisper no <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing Tom Holland as James Bond in uh, Jesus Christ. Don't do this to me. It's going to pr brace yourself. Prepare yourself now. Oh, I give God. you 80 percent odds. That's that's my bet is that Tom Holland. Tom Holland. Really? Is, Tom Holland is James Bond. He's too high British, profile. The right age. He's too high profile. Mm, maybe. I actually think the likelihood of that happening has gone down since the sale of MGM to to Amazon uh, because when this when the Bond movies were uh, like an MGM Sony Pictures co-production 100% <laughs> Tom Holland was going to be the next Bond <laughs> I just hope that I just hope that Aeon Productions like holds their effing ground now that you know as you can say that they're owned by Amazon that they're not like all right well we're going to do a spin-off with this you know and we're going to do a limited series on Amazon Prime with this and it's like no 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 stop 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 just let bond make a movie every three years yeah <laughs> don't don't turn it into an oversaturated franchise please yeah everybody's high on on continuity based universes right now but don't don't do it don't do it you've tried once and it was bad <laughs> <laughs> don't try to expand that universe don't try to make an interconnected the marvel cinematic universe just don't do it you've got a 60 year history of just telling one-off stories where there's occasionally very loose continuity between films it's been incredibly lucrative basically every movie makes a billion dollars except in the middle of a global pandemic <laughs> just you know it works yeah. Well, we have been recording for about three days and someday I wish to see my family again. So we should stop putting off where we rank these movies or this movie yeah. on our list. Yeah, let's do that. OK, so what? Pre-title? Pre-title. All right. Yeah, it's still basically in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, it's been so long since we've did these. I don't remember what any of the pre-title sequences are. The bike jump is <laughs> the the bike jump is cool. It's a good car chase. It's also twenty five minutes, and a lot of stuff didn't need to be there. Yeah, I think the fact that the first twelve minutes are basically without purpose significantly and dramatically marks this one down for me. That said, it's definitely better than Fabergé egg clown. <laughs> <laughs> statistically most of these are better than fabergé egg clown and i i'm inclined to agree with you so that puts it in the top two thirds uh view to a kill oh view to a kill is the skiing down the mountain into the iceberg shaped submarine what about tomorrow never dies tomorrow never dies is james bond oh and the jet and the jet and the the weapons deal the weapons market Right. Yeah, that one's pretty good. I mean, I've got it exactly in the middle, but it's pretty good. I think this goes down closer to iceberg-shaped submarine. This might go just above Fabergé egg clown, actually. I'm going to put this just between The Man with the Golden Gun and Tomorrow Never Dies. Goldfinger opening, is that duck hat? Oh, it is! It's the, the duck hat! Okay, yeah. this is going just behind Goldfinger for me. <laughs> <laughs> because you're right the stunt the stunts are super good when we eventually get to them so okay. I'm, I'm gonna put this between goldfinger and octopussy all right title sequence the actual theme song i agree with you that it sounds very similar to specter 
I liked it better than Spectre, so I'm putting it above Spectre. Okay. Ironically, I have Spectre much higher in my list. Well, two points higher in my list than I than you have Spectre. Yeah. You know, do I like it better than License to Kill? I think this goes above Moonraker for me. I'm committing to it. This goes above Moonraker for me. So this is below Tomorrow Never Dies and above Moonraker for me. I'm actually going to adjust up higher because I'm now remembering them. They're all sort of flooding back. And I, I think it needs more, but I think I like it better than even than The World Is Not Enough. Okay. So I think I'll, this slots in between Moonraker and The World Is Not Enough for me. I'll allow it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, like I actually in- enjoyed watching this movie quite a bit, but in the panoply of Bond, it's pretty medium all the way along. Because where do you put the film? Uh, so my where I have it on Letterboxd, where I've actually placed it on Letterboxd, is immediately above Spectre. Oh, interesting. So I have it below The Man with the Golden Gun and above Spectre. I think I probably am going to adjust that up from here, but mm-hmm. I don't think I'm going to adjust that up a lot. Man with the Golden Gun was kind of mean, and this isn't mean everyone in it is great but everyone in man with the golden gun was great too they were just working with (laughs) what they could yeah of course i like man with the golden gun way more than you (laughs) yeah the world is not enough that's the one with the pipeline right yep okay it's better than that is it better than tomorrow never dies i don't think so that's where i'm putting it i think i'd rather watch tomorrow never dies than this tomorrow never dies is half as long (laughs) (laughs) i'm actually putting it just above tomorrow never dies all right there we go Which is still like, I don't know, 13th, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, after all that, it's fine. It's fine. It's a fine movie. I don't know. I might put that well. I might qualify that as below the line where Bond movies are bad. (laughs) Oh, sorry. 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 Let me, (laughs) let me, let me try that with a different inflection. It's fine. Come out. To quote Matilda. Come out. Yeah. Not bad. (laughs) Not bad. There we are. We did it. Cool. Yeah, we did it. It's done. There are no more Bond movies left to rank. And it wasn't even a five hour long recording like people thought it might be. Yet. We're at 421. (laughs) I don't think think it's going to take us 40 minutes to wrap up. Oh, you say that. (laughs) We got to come up with what our next podcast is, Graham. Well, okay. So you and I have talked about this and we didn't discuss actually mentioning it on this podcast, but I'm going to anyway. I didn't even think we had discussed anything. (laughs) I was just throwing that out as a joke. But if you want to discuss a future podcast, I'm super in. Well, no, because you and I talked about looking at the the history of James Bond video games. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. In a similarly limited sort of like quasi podcasty let's play series replay with love (laughs) right we were we were joking about it and then i was like oh obviously we'd call it replay with love and you were like oh well now we have to oh well now we have to yeah yeah exactly so that's something that we're looking at doing we have no time we have no time expected for that but that is something (laughs) we just we have no time time. (laughs) period end of sentence we have no time goodbye thank you for listening we have no we have no idea when when we might get around to doing that maybe by the time this episode comes out maybe we'll have a better idea but that's that's something that yeah hopefully like to pursue in in 2022 it'd be a different sort of thing because rather than like a two-hour episode on one game we'd probably like play through the games because wouldn't that be fun but details to follow when we know them because right now we don't but the point is you can look forward to more from specifically myself and matt in the future whenever that may be i will also put forward Yes. As an alternative, I have had many requests. And I mean, James and I have also fielded many requests, but I have had many requests to do any number of film franchises. And I think this is a lot of fun and I would love to do more. I agree. I would love to just continue doing movie podcasts because I get a lot of pleasure out of doing movie podcasts. (laughs) I'm on board and hopefully you all are at home as well. But until then, until we talk again... You can talk to us online. Easiest yeah. way to get a hold of either of us is Twitter. Mine is yeah. at Graham underscore LRR. And at Matt underscore LRR, which I increasingly feel like I should update. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a loading ready run thing. I'm Not still... if you keep doing podcasts with us. I yeah, don't, exactly. Yeah. This is this is why I have to do keep doing podcasts because I can't get the Twitter name I want. And so I have to just continually make my presence known from time to time to justify my continued <laughs> use of the underscore lrr on my twitter name (laughs) that's the whole Um, reason i do this perfect so yeah until then uh, a reminder of course that everything that we do including this show and all our other stuff is brought to you by you the listener at our patreon patreon.com slash loading ready run 
I want to thank anyone who may have helped me doing the audio edit on this because it might be Kathleen or it might be Jordan or I might be doing it all by myself. I don't know, but you'll have to stay around for the end credits. I want to thank Featherweight for doing all the wonderful art that we've had through the episodes. And of course, Matt Griffiths for the terrific video edits. They're great. If you're only listening audio only, we really appreciate you. But give a look to the to the video ones because they're fun too. But that's it. So unless you have anything further to add, Matt. I don't think so. All right. This well, has then, been a blast. This has been an enormous pleasure. I was going to say, it's been an absolute pleasure doing these with you. And I look forward to doing more stuff at some point. Yeah. All right. Goodbye, everybody. In some form or another, this podcast will return. Mm-hmm.